All right, guys, we don't really have time for an intro. I'm already super late to this shit. Um, this is like, I don't really care about views. I'm just going to do this debate. I'm live streaming it for your convenience. Uh, I was, I'm like an hour late. I was family related stuff. So I do have a good excuse. But uh, we're here. We're just going to fucking get into it. And I'm going to kind of give a lecture afterwards. So yeah, that's going to happen. When the stream is concluded, I'm going to be, like, giving a lecture or something. So, yeah. So, yeah. We have... I have content lined up for you. All right? So, I'm going to get into this debate with the Orthodox Canonist. And let me just get some stuff ready. All right. Okay, I'm going to join the thing right now. Yeah, I can't do anything else, but yeah, that's what I'll say. Yeah, well, I'll let Mom Chilo speak real quick, but just what I'll, only thing I'll say about that is, I, I hear what you're saying, but if we're not going to do some kind of, like, higher criticism or, like, intellectual, actually kind of thing, like, like that part, one of the big things on our show is that we actually think things mean kind of what they obviously mean, especially in the context of scriptures and the church and a lot of this modern, a lot of these perspectives that people claim are, you know, are, are legit and ancient ways of interpreting things are actually just, oh, with the man himself is here, Mom Chilo, I'll let you speak, but it looks like Haas is is um, attractive, especially in our current uh, world that we live in, right? Because you look around at the sort of sensible political alternatives that you have, and it seems like for, for most of the world, or at least for those of us living here in the West, we do not have really alternatives outside of liberalism in any way. And you can look to um, communism, you can look to Marxism, and you can look at um, how uh, Marxists, Leninists, um, and those associated with them or we're seeing how we're seeing capitalism and in a way, I mean, we can talk about how exactly um, people, these thinkers viewed capitalism, but one way they viewed it was, it was like this thing that fundamentally, um, like for instance, like economic laws, like one thing, uh, you know, Engel talks about, Engels talks about um, is that, you know, capital, capitalists like to tell us, and I think Marx does too, that like capitalists like to tell us that uh, there's certain laws of capitalism, but really it's all random. But what the sort of Marxist, the theory more or less says is that, but in actuality, it's all man at the root of all these things. And therefore we can, if we kind of adapt the right consciousness or, you know, not saying it exactly, but more or less, if we do that, then we're able to change the trajectory that we're going on and we're able to, you know, sort of justify the arc of history, the sort of bloody arc of history. And we're able to make all of this bloody struggle, um, you know, all these revolutions, all these protests, all these, all this death, we're able to make it worth it. So in that sense, I sort of do understand, but I think that at root though, um, you know, uh, Conrad and um, Orthodox candidates, you guys were talking a little bit about the sort of historical context of, uh, you guys were talking a little bit about the historical context of what exactly uh, happened with the Soviet Union and some of the martyrs and even in other places on the Eastern Bloc countries. Um, you know, that is that is one thing. That I think that is a valid point. However, I think there's also just the other point about, you know, what the views of religion um, from Marx, Lenin, and Engels themselves were. And I don't think it's by no means is it um, really um, compatible with Christianity. And I think even this idea of thinking that, oh, well, Christianity is actually good. Well, you know, like, uh, for instance, our buddy here was saying, our friend here was saying that, oh, well, for instance, people like Hegel, who Marx was influenced by, said that Christianity was good because it's like this best human project that we're able to sort of meet God with. But Christianity is not made by, you know, human hands. It's from God. It's not um, something that it's not based on in humanity and like our, in the way that we understand humanity, rather God is, it gives us it and the church gives us it. Right. It's not a human creation by any means. So a lot of these um, sort of humanists will say, Oh yeah, Christianity is beautiful. Look at the aesthetics. Oh, wow. It gives people this sense of like the Supreme or whatever, but they all couch in more or less sort of metaphor. Uh, because I showed up late. Um, I like, I can't really expect to like debate first because they're in the middle of something, I guess. 
So I guess that's on me. I showed up late, but kind of want to get into the debate with Orthodox. Do we humans made? This is not just one of our beautiful creations. No, this is actually like from God Himself. So we would totally reject that humanistic conception of religion, which um, it seems like um, our buddy was espousing here. Yeah, I tend to agree with that. Um, actually, that analysis where, you know, religion is viewed as sort of this project which needs to kind of align itself with the material world. In fact, Orthodox Christianity goes beyond that. It's something obviously above material and it's metaphysical at the end of the day. You know? So uh, has, do you have much to say, sir? Uh, yeah, I kind of wanted to talk about, it seems like, you know, you wanted to debate PRISM or, or something and he can't do it, so I'm kind of filling in for PRISM when it comes sure. to the legacy of Soviet communism and specifically Russian orthodoxy. And what I'm interested in discussing is this question of whether or not the Orthodox Church and it's are the rulings of the Orthodox Church are in fact infallible or whether they're constricted by time and space since they're on earth. So, for example, a given um, patriarch or a given, you know, church leader, I don't really think it's in the Orthodox tradition. And I can be corrected if I'm wrong, that what they say is necessarily like infallible. I think they're able to make mistakes and they're able to change their mind, right, according to circumstance, because they are bound by time and space. Yeah, I guess, look, I'll throw you a bone here, and I'm not sure if you're analysts in your Discord or some of your community members who actually read Russian, because I take it as you don't, do you speak Russian, or? No, I don't. Okay, so if anyone does read Russian, I encourage them, at least in your community, to actually read the two anathemas, right, and actually look in depth at the text, because that in the text, uh, no ideology is in fact condemned. What is condemned is the confiscation of church property, which the communists under Lenin, Trotsky, and the entire, you know, essentially the entire government, no one really opposed these decisions. Right. Uh, you know, the early Bolshevik government were doing. Not, not yep. to cut you off too early, but a few things that anathemas are not final. They're not, it's not the same as damnation. Only God can engage in damnation. So someone who is subjected, it doesn't, it's not like a certain, it doesn't with certainty condemn a given person subjected to the anathema to hell, to the extent of my knowledge. Now, the second thing is that regarding the confiscation of church properties, I think here, I don't really think it would be justifiable to blame Lenin necessarily for that. You had a huge kind of anti-religious sentiment that was fanatically adopted by these rank and file you know, young communist cadres who are, and then also a, a level of corruption and infiltration uh, below in the lower commands, right? Through the chain of, um, sorry, the, like the hierarchical chain of control mm. for the Bolsheviks. And oftentimes, I'm just trying to find it here exactly. Oftentimes, you'd have people like Stalin, like for example, in 1923. Trying to find the exact quote. Um, fuck, hold on, give me a sec. It's, yeah, right here. We'll intervene and basically talk about how, you know, these people are taking things too far. They're engaging in blasphemous kind of desecration of idols. They're burning things. They're, and then most importantly, they are using excuses. Um, according to the like bureaucratic registration of properties in order to close down churches. So let me give you an example of this because, yeah, so for the crime of not registering, right, uh, Baptist societies were closed, Orthodox churches were closed, and this was purely because they wouldn't register with the local government, and that gave, they gave them the excuse to that, right? And stop... Stalin was pretty frank in saying in 1923 in an internal letter to the other members of the Communist Central Committee that this was illegal, it was a violation of party directives, and it was causing ferment and discontent. And then he was also mentioning how the Central Committee, is was dis, he was involved in the decision that, you know, they're going to prohibit the closure of churches, they're going to prohibit the liquidation of prayer rooms and buildings, 
prohibit the liquidation of um, prayer rooms for like non-payment of taxes, prohibit arrests of religious nature, renting premises to religious societies, uh, make them strictly comply with the decision of the ARCE and like don't give them an undue burden. So I, 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 I can, don't respond, keep I can respond to these all this, or do you have another point besides the... Like, no, no, I, I do, I do. So I understand that in terms of implementation, the people on the ground we're not necessarily following the spirit of the Communist Party leadership, and specifically the leadership of Stalin, or even Lenin for that matter. But when it comes to the intentions of the communist leaders, it was not to actually... And also, when it came to the confiscation of church property, I believe some of this was done under the pretext of relief, um, of uh, starvation relief and feeding the hungry. Some of this was also um, done because of something about military units. Let me find the exact quote. But initially, what from what I read, what happened was that military units were given, should they so choose, that were church military units. If they wanted to um, convert the units or the property into non-church property, they were given the ability... Now, this was initially extremely minuscule. You can you can go ahead. I'm going to find the thing about the military units. Give me a second. Yeah, I just want to mention... I'm going to... Hold on, hold on, Dimitri. I'll, I'll, let, I'll let you talk for the majority of this. But I just wanted to say, first of all, that, like, from a get-go, I don't think that you... Like, from a religious perspective in general, the regime was already compromised based on its foundation as ritual murders of children and of the, of the rightfully anointed czar. And any... Orthodox church or institution would be right to not register with such a government due to their belief in the in the martyred sovereign. So that alone, I think, from a religious perspective, doesn't exempt this this property nonsense from just oh, it was just the pad implementation right, okay, of this property. Okay, I'll, I'll get and, and, okay, go ahead. Let me say, let me. But I'm going to say one other thing, and then I'm going to let Dimitri talk. We've all seen the video of Christ the Savior Cathedral literally just being destroyed. Like there's just like that was had to be rebuilt in the freaking twenty like after the fall of the USSR. So that's just a, like that. It doesn't like again. Maybe I'm not saying that discounts all of your points, but people just need to realize some of this stuff. And Dimitri, I'll let you actually address some of the other things. Yeah, first the um, confiscation of church property. So the Russian Orthodox Church, in particular, gave a shit ton of confessions. I, I mean, concessions. Apologies, not confessions. Well, it would have been good for confessions, but concessions were provided to the Bolshevik government in abundance, right? And you're probably aware. Patriarch Tikhon did not even support the White Army during the Civil War. Because you're right, there was famine and there was, you know, people dying in the countryside due to, you know, just basically the entire imperial infrastructure breaking down because of the Civil War. And, you know, the post, uh, essentially post-World War I marauders just going around deserting, you know, looting, things like that. So there was famine. Now, the I think Patriarch Tikhon in particular, he actually did allow for church decorations to be actually donated to the Bolshevik government or, the, you know, it was the government at the time. It wasn't necessarily like he donated it to communism or out of any ideological consideration, but just to assist the people. My, one thing that he didn't give, which is why we have, say, the martyrdoms of Metropolitan Benjamin of Petrograd, which is St. Petersburg, was he, he said, you cannot donate and we will not allow Bolsheviks or anybody for that matter to to touch the holy vessels. Now, I'm not sure if you guys know what the holy vessels are in the Orthodox Church. Those are the chalices and the instruments usually gold plated or solid gold and silver which are used in the administration of the eucharist the most important sacrament in the church now the bolsheviks really didn't uh, i mean they probably knew what the you know sacraments were they all grew up in the orthodox society in order to even graduate from high school you needed to know the basics of the orthodox faith in russia so they knew what these instruments were and they still went to them and this resulted uh, resulted in probably several hundreds of martyrdoms, including Metropolitan Benjamin and his entire parish. Okay, so um, I first want to address the question of the killing of the Tsar's family. An investigation was conducted by the Russian government. Unless you wanted to, you were had more to say? or No, no, no. You, okay. We can talk about the... Well, Tsar. an investigation was conducted by the Russian government within the past 20 years, I believe. Um, and they found that Lenin and his government were not guilty of the murder of the Tsar's family. As far as the circumstances of like who actually gave the order, it's not really certain under what circumstances was the Tsar's family murdered. Like who 
was behind this, what was the reason for it. But the Russian government, well, I don't know if they absolved Lenin of definitive guilt, but they could not find any evidence that Lenin was involved in the murder of the, uh, the Tsar's family. It was the intention of the Soviet government, quite openly, to try the Tsar uh, for, not his kids, obviously, but to try the Tsar for his perceived or alleged crimes uh, against the people. Now, regarding this thing about the murdered sovereign, that's kind of go kind of goes back to what I was saying about whether or not the church is bounded by. I don't. I don't want to theologically get in trouble here. I don't necessarily mean mm. the church, but whether or not the functions of the church are bound by time and space, rather than being infallible. Because I don't think it's the orthodox view that you know the the church in its worldly sense is infallible. I think that. Um, the church has always been bound by political circumstance. Peter the Great, for example, famously prohibited the elections of the patriarch. This is something that only happened uh, in the 20th century. The first time it happened was after the February Revolution, because the czars have actually prohibited this. And the loyalty of the Orthodox Church to the political time and place circumstances, it's well recorded throughout history. You had murdered sovereigns, for example, in the time of troubles, who can forget the, you know, the era of... Uh, yeah, Boris Godunov and yeah, uh, Tsar Basil and even Lejeu Dimitri II, right? Like, yeah, all these characters. Yeah. We get it. It was tumultuous. Right. It's an, it, That's what I mean. The Russian Tsardom, the Russian sovereignty has always been tumultuous. And I think there is just a kind of... I think the re some one of the reasons why a lot of communists within Russia, who are devout Orthodox believers don't condemn, don't necessarily like see the Bolsheviks as satanic because of the death of the Tsar's family. Is I, th I think it's horrible when children are murdered, by the way. I, mean, I, don't, I, I don't think any, even, even the person who was accused of this, who people suspected carried out this act, he kind of lived, from what I know, a life of shame in Moscow. He wasn't really, he was kind of looked down on and he was, you know, even among fellow Bolsheviks, right? So I don't I just I definitely don't agree with, you know, anyone's kids, any children being murdered, any women being murdered who were innocent. But you know, I think many Russian communists have just come to see this like this is part of the tumultuous history of Russian sovereignty. Sim similar to the time of troubles, right? The Bolsheviks came to especially under Stalin um uh acquire what's called the Russian vlast right? The kind of Russian form of sovereignty that's just kind of like almost mystical and inherent in the people. But I mean, I'm not here to necessarily deny that there was an anti-religious sentiment among the, because of the revolution. There was, I mean, I'm not denying that. That's like a fact, right? And there was this huge iconoclasm, especially among the youth who kind of went a 180. Usually young people are inspired by religion. They become the most fanatical believers but after the revolution, it's like the opposite happened. They became the most devout atheists. They became militant atheists. They were engaging in desecratory acts and all these kind of spectacles. Stalin openly condemned this. Other communist leaders condemned it. But no, it, it did happen. The League of Militant Atheists produced a lot of blasphemy. And right. Was, but the way I see it is I'm not really trying to portray a one-sided picture of like Every aspect of the early days of the communist ideology was infallible and perfect. I kind of want to more present a story of a uniquely Russian kind of estrangement with tradition and religion that accompanied modernity and a reconciliation and a, a development of a learning, right? I think there was a maturity of the communist ideology, which began to realize that, and this is something that was echoed by, um, Orthodox leaders under Soviet rule that, you know, a lot of communism took for granted this biblical unconscious. Russian Orthodox values, of, despite all of this blasphemous stuff and all of this kind of, you know, yes, we're atheists, it still took for granted these this fundamental bedrock of unconscious moral values that nobody even would dare to question. Even the communist, like, iconography and art and literature it was it's all very much rooted in that russian orthodox spiritual tradition even if it's superficially estranged and i think 
that is something people have today become consciously aware of. And that's why we're seeing, especially in Russia, a growth of orthodox communist or religiously orthodox communists. And I don't really see how this is a contradiction. I mean, I'll, I'll answer your first thing about um, epistemology and the church and infallibility and those kinds of things. I think you're thinking about this in already a one post-schism in just a very Western way. Like, historically, before the Pope in the, began to assert his infallibility and his what eventually became you know, fully dogmatized at Vatican I for the Western Church and papal infallibility and whatnot. Before that, it's the Church is synodal. We view the ecumenical councils as the voice of the Holy Spirit, as is said in the Book of Acts. It's to seem good to us in the Holy Spirit. That was the first that council in Jerusalem in the Book of Acts. We it, what we what we see in the in this synodality. And Dimitri has cited many proclamations of the synod of the Russian Orthodox Church. There were many examples of synods that were then later affirmed by an ecumenical council as as correct and as 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 teaching dogma as effectively being, you know, infallible. And for, that's not, and the thing is, you think about that, there was, you know, there were perhaps decades, even longer of time when those things weren't considered infallible by said ecumenical council, but we now, that's not that they were deemed correct, they were always correct. The ecumenical council then expounded them as correct in the face of heresy and in the face of the current issues of the time. And in the time of communism, that was, the church has expounded its opinion on those things. And we also, in that context, we believe in the consensus patrum, the, the consensus of the fathers. That's one of our guiding epistemologies in the time where it's been a while since we've had an ecumenical council, especially since there has been no emperor, since the martyr of the Tsar, martyrdom of the Tsar. And the consensus patrum, by our standards now, is entirely anti-communist, is entirely in favor of, the the, the, the church has a history, and the, the martyrdom as in hagiographies are how we, look back on, on the history of, of these things. And I don't think that any kind of nitpicking about the specific laws and whatnot in any way necessarily make up for the fact that it happened and the fact that ultimately they did supplant and put a new religion on the people and made Lenin out to be a czar and had him exposed in his body. Like my dad saw his body when he was going, when he went to Russia near the end of the times of the Soviet Union. Like this was, there was an entire, this was a this was a new, we were, as the 20th century had many, it was one of the many religions that was foisted upon an unsuspecting people as modernity realized itself in its failures. And I think, yeah, Dimitri has a lot more to say about the history of some things that you had mentioned, but I think that's important. And after he does, I want to talk a little bit about also some of the history and about how, I'm sorry, but the entire communist project in in, in Russia was 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 put on by by Western capitalists, bankers, Zionists. So I think that from historical perspective, I'm sure you have answers to that. But I'll let Dimitri address some other things. Yeah, I'd say just on the on the issue of monarchy and the orthodox understanding of autocracy and an emperor tsar, a sort of this figure of secular power in the church. That role is undisputed since the time of Constantine the Great, and many would say even the pagan Roman emperors held a certain esteemed role, even when they committed persecution as to this keeper of order in the um, Icumene, you know, the, the the cosmos, the Mediterranean Sea. So this is what Apostle Paul talks about. St. John Chrysostom mentions it. So the Orthodox Church is united. What I'm trying to say is it's united entirely behind the idea that the Tsar is important, the Emperor is important, and the Emperor is not bound by any sort of weird parliamentary regulations, things of this nature. This is the um, dominant tradition for the last hundreds, if not close to, you know, maybe close to a thousand saints, and they all affirm the fact that the Tsar and the Emperor is important in the Church. And this goes back to the Old Testament too, so it's not just a New Testament thing, it's that the Tsar is as important as a bishop in the Church, this similar role, similar sort of sacramentology blessing. And the, the fact that St. Tsar Nicholas II was apparently tried by some court and sentenced death, even if that was, say, that did occur, say he was executed by hanging or a firing squad, because the criminal justice system of the Bolshevik government deemed him guilty. Like, that would still be inappropriate. So we, we're not even arguing just the fact that he was right, shot. But what or, about, yeah. not to interrupt mm -hmm. you, but just to focus on this point, but there's, but that's worldly state power. So Tsars is, yes. and Roman pagan emperors, they can be deposed. There can be conflicts where they can get killed. So I, I'm, I guess I'm looking for here, why is it that the Bolsheviks could not fulfill, specifically Stalin, why can't he fulfill the same theological role that a czar could? For example, a Roman pagan emperor. Good point. Uh, good point. And actually, some Orthodox communists, so to speak, in Russia actually do argue that point. They call Stalin the Red Tsar. You know, Zuganov says that the head of the KPRF party of Russia, you know, Prahanov, the famous communist 
or what they do say these it's like oh wow so the soviet union in some way it did kind of continue on this katekon legacy but again this is a, a bit of a stretch i would say in, in the fact that no orthodox saints living or those deceased in the last 100 years actually confirmed this right the best thing that someone can say right. about the best tradition we have is patriarch Ilya, who is like who could be canonized a saint after his repose he says he believes stalin repented on his deathbed so like he even in the sense of he who wrote, looked up to stalin because he views him as a co-ethnic as a georgian he still has to couch his the best thing he can say about him is he believes that due to perhaps some of his early christianity he repented of his sins and reverted at the end of his life and that's also rejected by most orthodox historians anyway so i think that's one thing and again the the there's there was also no just like even if somehow everything you said was true about that which it isn't there is no like the ideal this this entire revolutionary basis of something is not something that a, a divinely inspired ruler that someone participating in orthodox symphonia could be based upon but even more than that there was no basis in economics for the revolution in the first place yes the war led to some bad things there was extreme pressure on russia from overseas, but even dur- I mean, before, I mean, William Howard Taft said that the Tsar of Russia, his imperial majesty, Tsar Nicholas II, and his state bank had created a worker's paradise that was unrivaled in history of mankind. You can read the economic numbers on the Tsar and on the on the empire, and I'm sure all, yeah, I see people laughing, it's hilarious. All these communists in there, they think they know it, but they got their big brother to come argue for them, it's hilarious. But I think well, hold the... On, uh, hold, on. hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me finish, let me finish. The... You can read the economic numbers, read Stephen Mitford Goodson, and you can look into these things. And I also recommend people read Count Major Strep Spiridovich on all of these things and recognize that the historical, the entire historical basis for this is nonsense. And the entire communist project in Russia, from my perspective, was a Bolshevik, Jew, was, a, was a Zionist Jewish project sent from Western capitalists who were going to overthrow the Tsar. And that's the opinion of many, especially considering that his murder was, was literally a ritual, which is the consensus of many Orthodox all right, bishops. Well, Okay. This is this but here's, is the, here's the problem. Oh, bro, okay, this is my space, man. You can't just interrupt all of us all the time. I'm telling you, I'm giving you as much Yo, time. You as gotta you chill out, dude. No, <laughs> I'm sure, but the I'm I'm making the point here about I'm, you're you're gonna get heated now because the narrative in general is being challenged a bit, and I think that's the perspective of many people who are Orthodox, who are not capitalists, who have no interest in the Western Atlantic narrative that they understand what communism in Russia was really about. All right. Well, I just wanted to address something you said, because I think you're now ch- you're changing this from a theological argument, strictly within the realm of what's, what the concern of the church is, and you're kind of just shoehorning in these kind of like CIA, British intelligence narratives to discredit the October Revolution from a secular historiographical perspective. So just to address that secular argument that you're making, that the Bolshevik Revolution was illegitimate and there was no economic basis, even p- figures within the Black Hundred movement, which Lenin astutely observed in 1913, like Bishop Nikon, started to raise the land, quote, the land, bread, and other important questions of our Russian life. What happened to people like Bishop Nikon? They were completely ostracized by both the church and the Black Hundred movement just because they were drawing attention to the fact that the Russian people who are being um, indebted, you know, you, you have to understand something about the Russian state at the time. It was just fully indebted to the Russian, ba- to the French banks. It kept on taking more and more debt. The, the peasants were starting to become immiserated. Their land was being expropriated, especially because of the Stolypin reforms. They were being proletarianized. They were losing their livelihood and they were indebted right at the same time. So to say that the revolution had no basis whatsoever and that it had to somehow be a complete conspiracy is just fully ahistorical. And you talk about all this stuff about, oh, I mean, you're talking about, oh, this is a conspiracy of Wall Street. I think you're drawing from Anthony Sutton or something. But you neglect to mention how the Russian czar and the Russian state was, first of all, I mean, to talk about the secular historiography here, let's let's do it, right? The Russian state was indebted to French banks and therefore connected to the international capitalist system of finance. It entered into World War I because of its obligation to this financier ruling class. The Tsar himself um, actually descended from the British line, line of royalty through Queen Victoria and through the king of Denmark, like the rest of the European royalty, he wasn't even really. But so you Russian. come in here and it's all about reconciling the czar with communism, and now it's no, all the no, no. Here from I, everybody. I actually it's, do it's, not. All, it's the, it's I am every not damn interested. Time. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I am not interested in reconciling the Romanov dynasty 
with communism. I think the Romanov dynasty was not a Russian dynasty, but it was kind of this almost European colonial force, pr primarily Germanic. And, you know, it's not really a Russian dynasty when you look at it from a historical perspective. Peter the Great was a westernizer. Stalin took note of this in his talks with Sergei Eisenstein, who, fil who f directed the uh, Ivan the Terrible movie and Nevsky. And even Stalin's sentiment was pretty clear that he became aware that he was actually restoring Russia to its pre- Peter the Great, pre-Western era. He was restoring Russia to the Eastern Christian, Eastern Orthodox, or Eastern civilizational tradition that you saw in Muscovy and so on, right? Placing more of an emphasis on the capital of Moscow over Leningrad and St. Petersburg. Stalin was consciously aware of what was going on here. And then moreover, under the Romanovs, the oppression of the 90% Russian present majority is so like indisputable these people had no access to civil life they weren't educated whatsoever you had a germanized elite and a westernized elite ruling over Good a so-called asiatic non-civilized horde of quote-unquote backward people the russian state didn't serve the broad russian mass it served an elite of european europe european westernizers basically enlightened westernizers the Black Hundred movement, for example, didn't even draw huge ranks from the peasants. The Black Hundreds were made up of urbanized lumpen. And so okay, on. Well, well, one sec. Yeah. So, do you think, uh, say, Vladika Nikon, right, Rozhdesinsky, who you mentioned, the bishop, right, who was later martyred by Bolsheviks as well, he died under mysterious circumstances outside of his monastery. Is that monastery. the same Probably guy just shot. was talking about? Yes. Well, are you, most are you certain yes, of that? Because... Uh, yes, it would be Bishop Nikon Rozhjesminsky because he did write about, you know, these things. He wrote actually a lot. He's one of the only bishops who isn't canonized, actually, despite the fact that he was uh, esteemably shot by so why uh, some isn't sort of communist vandals. Well, because they're actually still canonizing saints. I think every year it's close to the, it's in the, te num in the tens, if not hundreds of folks are being canonized in Russia. There's a waiting list. Was, of he not, was he not ostracized by the church because he drew attention he was, to he the was. land? But that's a separate subject, which... Yeah. That's I, I would actually about. love to speak about, right? Like the ostracization of right-wing conservative clergymen in the church prior to February no, and prior he, to October. But it, was, it was because he yeah. spoke, he wanted to the, do the dude, bare is, minimum. Dude, I'm really, we, I'm really not trying to interrupt you, but you can't just interrupt us. All right, okay, go yeah, we, I, I want to speak on just the, the subject of, um, you know, you, you, mentioned, you, you mentioned the fact that, you know, communism had this, uh, so, sorry, the Romanov Empire, firstly, right? The 300-year Romanov Empire had some sort of you know, uh, oppressing, oppressing notion to it. Now, this oppressing notion isn't evident in any of the writings of the church saints. Now, you may say, well, that's because they were under the thumb of the synod, under the thumb of the bishops. But we're talking about bishops such as Saint Innocent of Alaska, Saint Herman of Alaska, Saint, you know, we can go, we can list Bishop Saint John of Kronstadt who resurrected people, right? In our, in our belief, we believe he literally resurrected folks. And he was there on the deathbed of Alexander III. And his famous quote, he said, well, look, I've resurrected people before, but for whatever reason, God doesn't wish to heal you know, Emperor Alexander III. Like, like all these our little anecdotal facts, they build up this compendium that, hey, the Romanov dynasty wasn't perfect, neither was the Komnenos dynasty, neither was the dynasty of Constantine the Great, the equal to the apostles, or even St. Vladimir's dynasty, which founded Russia, essentially, with the, with the early Rus. The dynasty is not perfect, neither are clergymen in the church. So we, we will never argue has from the position that, well, the Romanovs were something really perfect and we really need to go back. We don't LARP. The realistic, the matter of fact reality is that Romanovs did make mistakes, but so did the Rurikids, which had thousands of civil wars. I mean, not thousands, but, you know, tens of civil wars, which is why the Mongols invaded. There was a lot of failures. And even Time of Troubles is a Rurikid, technically like a Rurikid conflict, right? And I suppose if you are a monarchist, you would kind of come to terms with the fact that dynasties aren't perfect. And the Romanovs, the Romanovs, mind you, are not condemned by a single saint in the church. I would challenge any russians or any russian speakers to go find me archival documents letters works of any saints which condemn the entire dynasty this is not a christian perspective that we just take a whole dynasty take the entire family and say okay you guys were awful you guys oppressed the masses now orthodoxy does comment on social equality and things of this nature but not by condemning the so-called oppressors and let's not compare Romanov oppression to the oppression of say the ussr and like the damages that has done to the russian people for example like I think that would be another conversation altogether, right? I think spiritually speaking, 
under the Romanovs. I agree, you shouldn't compare it because from a spiritual perspective, it was actually much worse. Under you're the bifurcating. Romanovs. I'm not sure. You, I'll let you keep going. I just want to make yeah. a quick point before. I'm sure you have a longer point. You're really bifurcating the spiritual versus the physical thing in a way. And I, I want to make a broader wrong point. With my mic. Okay, well, well, let me. I, I didn't interrupt you, so let me continue. So I was just saying, make that quick point because yeah, you're yeah. like, I just don't. Well, okay, the, the, he, he, here's what I want to get to, though. So the problem is that it's one thing for czars to be making mistakes, right? And, you know, you could say, oh, yeah, it was worse in the USSR, but really, it was the Romanovs, specifically under Peter the Great. This wasn't just a mistake made by any old czar. Peter the Great fundamentally thrusted the entire trajectory of Western modernity upon Russian civilization. Peter the Great opened the floodgates to Freemasonry and the basic Satanism that you see in the West. Now, you can blame the you know Russian modernity, as it's called, or Russian Enlightenment purely on the Bolsheviks. But then how do you explain the non-Bolsheviks? I would blame it on Peter dude, the Great. Dude, dude, don't I interrupt me. Don't Peter interrupt me. Okay, I didn't interrupt you. So you can't really look at the West right now. You look at the state of Satanism that exists in America and Europe and say, oh, yeah, this is all the fault of Bolshevism. No, this was that Satanism at the core of the West's founding, what the enlightened civilized West as we know it. That is what Peter the Great already brought to Russia. Right. So he was responsible for that. So that's not the same as, oh, just another czar who made mistakes. He fundamentally set Russia on the trajectory of, you know, basically completely what Gwinnon probably would call the complete inversion of um, the tradition with this kind of artificial satanic modernism, right? Everything that was holy, sorry, everything that was evil was disguised as its opposite. Now evil and wickedness and satanism could be disguised as opposite. Even the church of the Christ the Savior you mentioned the original blueprints for that church were designed by a Freemason who used Freemasonic geometrical principles in his construction. They were but then, but then it wasn't. Then it was overturned. That's that's false. Okay, sure. yes, the maybe the original blueprints, but yeah. the, then it was changed when the new star came in. After that, yeah, it doesn't matter. These were the original blueprints for it. Yeah, but then no, it was, no, that, no, that design on, was dude. totally it scrapped. Just, in once they figured that out, that design show, was totally scrapped. Yeah, and yet, it just goes to show, and this is a fact, how much the so-called traditional orthodox russian christianity under the romanovs was actually disguising freemasonry theosophy and other forms of satanism and this is a recorded historical fact okay. they use well, the on, cloth of the russian cut. orthodox religious tradition to disguise something fundamentally alien to it and then you don't even have to get into the occult and esoteric aspect of it either because you can just directly point to how the russian orthodox church and this is just a fact under the czar after the 20th century at least in the late 19th century became subservient to the worldly reality of capital and the capitalists and the bankers and the debt the czar was in so you literally had the reign of satanic finance capital and this was disguising itself in the holiness of the Orthodox Church. And that is why you had the hostility to religion that you saw among communists. Now, I'm not saying that hostility was justified, because I think they threw the baby out with the bathwater. But in order for a real reconciliation to take place, it has to be acknowledged that there was a deep-rooted corruption of the church at this time. And the goal, in my view... What the striving of the soul, Russian soul of the 20th century has been was to return to the authentic foundation of both Russian civilization and Russian orthodoxy. So I'll let you talk. Listen, I, I pre I'm not trying to be too polemical, but that was an interesting straw man that you built up to tear down. And the straw man being that you can like we don't have it's not the pope we don't believe that the czar is the pope the institution of the empire the catacomb as dmitry as we believe has a it has a semi sacerdotal role within the church the emperor is literally allowed behind the altar he communes he's able to commune himself this is this has a lot of symbolism if you this is the kind of thing if you want to have the sublime thinking that you all like to talk about these things actually matter you can't just hand with them aside as religiosity that capitalists use 
these things actually matter. So if you want to be consistent on your beliefs there, I, 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 I would appreciate not hand-waving that kind of things away just because you are, you're a particular tradition or you don't understand them. That also being said, I don't buy at least half of the historical stuff that you're saying. It's all, all this narrative on the, the Peter the Great. I agree. He had westernizing problems. He brought in Freemasons. You notice how you have to skip all the way up to the economic problems during the World War I era, because what happened between Peter the Great and Tsar Nicholas II? Every single Tsar is currently either is either canonized or considered by many in the Orthodox tradition to likely be a saint. Alexander III, Nicholas I, Nicholas II, of course, already a saint. These men preserved orthodoxy. These men rejected Westernization. And if you read actual history and not Marxist revisionism, which I appreciate certain revisionism, but I don't appreciate the, Mar the Marxist narrative of history, I think it's total nonsense. But I think broadly, if you read people like Spiridovich, you would understand that these people were killed by Masons. They were killed by Jews. And that's the kind of thing that I don't hear you talking about as much. And that's a, that's a big key to this. Communists, Jews, Zionists, people who established the state of Israel with the help of the Rothschild banking, Jews. Who else? The people that wanted to kill the monarch, the historical enemy of the Tsar, as Norm Eisen and any globalist neoliberal will tell you now. They're all Zionist Jews, and they ritually murdered Tsar Nicholas, and you just sit here and casually slander and repeat the little narratives and say your little things, and then it's, I just don't, I, it's just not ever going to convince anybody who's a serious Orthodox Christian, man. Uh, okay, but the problem is that you're mentioning, first of all, I'm going to address all of that, but first of all, you mentioned the sanctity, and oh, it does matter that these are czars. Why is the Bolshevik Revolution more illegitimate than what Peter the Great did? There's a change in sovereignty in the exercise of sovereign power. I agree, it was a revolution. But saying that the revolution it, uh, makes the Soviet government, because the Soviet government rests the foundations of its power on a revolution, makes it somehow less legitimate than these pagan you know, czars, even before Christianity. I find that complete nonsense, right? I can answer that. I explain, we've explained this like three times. Third Rome, it. Third Rome, Constantine, through the Byzantine emperors, through the through Ivan the Terrible and the Paleologos Empire, Third Rome, Moscow, the emperor in 1917, the true end of Christian imperium in the world. This is basic. That's a bunch Christian of jibber jabber. Explain, explain what you mean. How is that Asia? jibber jabber? This is known by you. This is known so by are you saying? Are you saying West. because? Are you saying it's because the line of Constantine, like genetically, was flowing through the blood? Not metaphysically. That's no, but, but why isn't it, then the if it's just metaphysical, then why Dude, isn't also we, we literally talked Stalin? about this in our latest episode of the podcast. Jane, read St. John Chrysostom's interpretation Dude, no, of the book you're not being coherent right now. Why is the October Revolution, why does that somehow end Russian sovereignty? Explain. Because it overthrew the anointed czar that the church but had appointed. But czars got overthrown Russia. all the time. That's not new. They got overthrown all and who, the time. And who? What did they get replaced by? Liberal democracy, communism? No, they got replaced what by another liberal ruler. democracy. Who? What liberal democracy did the Bolsheviks bring in? The Bolsheviks brought a more tough, more effective, and stronger czar. I said czar liberal democracy anyone, or communism. Any of those Stalin examples. was a greater czar. Than anyone in the Romanov dynasty or their descendants. Dude, shut the fuck up! Okay. Uh, hold on, yeah, retard. he was. Name the Jew, you fucking bitch. Hold on, hold on. What's? Dude, like, don't. Again, no, hey, hey, Conrad, I've been really respectful to you so far. Do not. And you, and this, you, no, you have Do not, do not make this. Do not, do things. not, do not make this unpleasant and have me starting to roast the shit out of you because it's not going to bode well for you, dude. So keep it respectful. Keep it fucking respectful, okay? You I need to keep respectful. it respectful in our space and not to immediately... You understand our opinion? We've made it very clear. No, no, I haven't called family. you names. I haven't called you names. I haven't insulted you. I haven't done anything like that. I've shared opinions that are making you butthurt right now. That's not grounds for you to start taking this to the next no, level. We and shared it, opinions that made you butthurt, so you started, started screaming and talking about the Romanovs being worse yeah, than I'm Stalin. Focusing you, on the, I'm focusing off. on the content you of got what we're talking off. about. You're, dude, no, dude, explain to me. You said that what me, I know. Dude, dude, you just said I was making gibberish. You said I was speaking gibberish. I told you, read the No, because you said, you said, you said, you said, dude. No, this is why. This is why I said it was gibber jabber. Because you said, <laughs> dude, we've already explained this. And then you said, Christian Imperium. And you just gave me a bunch of phrases without coherently explaining to me why it is that Stalin is an illegitimate ruler because the Tsar was overthrown in the February Revolution, which, by the way, wasn't even led by the Bolsheviks. Well, look, uh, firstly, Haas, right? You firstly interrupted Conrad and said his particular statement he was making, which was succinct and maybe didn't include all the details, was jibber jabber. Like, I think that's rude. Secondly, it right? Then. then explain it better. Okay, sure. I'll give you another chance, Conrad, so, to explain so it. The idea of the third Rome, okay? The 
third Rome idea comes from the second letter to the Thessalonians, chapter 2, verse 6, in particular. So Apostle Paul writes this about the Roman Empire, okay? Now, he writes this about the pagan Roman Empire, right? But with the role of the emperor and the empire as a whole, as a sort of preserving, this preserving government which holds back evil and the Antichrist. This is Orthodox eschatology. So to those who aren't Orthodox, it may sound a little bit weird. It's like, what are you guys talking about? It's like, yes, this is what Orthodox people believe in. In particular, St. John Chrysostom, who also wrote our most prominent liturgy. Okay, this is what he believed in as well. And the Russian saints after him. Now, what Conrad is saying, the third Rome idea, which Dugan writes about as well, right? Dugan believes in the third Rome idea. Dugan, Malafay of like... There's a whole website Dugan, called so. Catacon too. Exactly. So let's not let's not pretend like this isn't mainstream. No, no, okay, so let, let me just... I'm going to interrupt you really quick, interrupt you really quick to save okay. time. Now, I don't yep. disagree. I'm not um, trying to disagree with the notion of third Rome or anything like that, or even necessarily okay. the significance of the sovereign or what you want to call the czar in Russian Orthodoxy. What I'm hyper-focused on is what specifically makes Stalin an illegitimate ruler, because you're saying it's because in the February Revolution, the czar was overthrown, but czars get overthrown all the time because their rule is secular. So just explain that to me. I've, I've, I've never said the term illegitimate, right? Now, illegitimacy, um, only God can determine that. Now, was Stalin a certain scourge that was permitted by God, such as Balthazar and Nebuchadnezzar and all these you know, awful rulers in the past, right? In the Old Testament, you read about it in the Bible. Yes, probably. And that's what most of the Orthodox clergy... Okay, I'll simplify say, the well, question. I'll simplify right? the question. But they, why, so, why is it that it was the Bolshevik Revolution and not Peter the Great that definitively breaks the lineage of the Third Rome? Wrong. Uh, now, this is this I disagree with Dugan on because... Frankly, he isn't a historian, which, you know, he can, he's a lot of things, but he isn't a historian. He's a sociologist, geopolitical, geopolitical expert, philosopher, first and foremost. But his knowledge of the Peter the Great's era is, um, has holes in it, right? So Peter the Great also saw himself as a continuer in, in his own fashion. He even founded St. Petersburg, and I think he tried to align the dates of its founding to the founding of Constantinople in 3, 313 AD, I believe, or 312. So... So he actually tried to align himself with the Rome. Even the fact that he was shaving. Notice he called himself an emperor as opposed to a tsar. Why? He wanted to bring back that idea of, hey, I'm actually Roman like, like those guys in the past. So he, he had this right. uh, maybe childish, maybe novel, maybe totally not related idea, to Freemason. Still Orthodox. By the way, uh, I'm sorry. Go by on. the way, can't you at least accept that there's a possibility that was related to the Freemason, Freemason? veneration of Dude, okay, yes. Rome? Can I? Let me just make one point. Let me make one point. Sure. You, you're missing. We don't. We don't base the legitimacy of our government on whether the government is good or bad. I'm well, not, no, like, but for the Bolsheviks, I, I, no, you do. But for the Bolsheviks, you do. That's the problem. No, no that's that's the, that, the, that's on top of it. I have all those sorts of criticisms too, especially compared to the Tsarist government, which I believe was good fundamentally. But as Dmitry has explained, the, but when your government, first of all, when your government is literally founded on the mar the previous government when those people were martyred, that's that's a problem. That's a and and when that government is ongoing persecuting the church, that is a problem. And you when say it's a the problem. No, the institution like, because when the ins when the church itself and Symphonia, the government, you talk about how they you believe that they threw the baby out with the bathwater and throwing out the institution of the church and the sublimity and all this kind of stuff. It was Symphonia is a fundamental touching and in, indescribable collaboration between the church and the state as was seen in the, in the Byzantine Empire. The, the pagan emperors that you claim are also legitimate according to church scripture? That did no, before it did not. The... No, no, it did not. But a lot of things didn't exist under the pagan Roman Empire, has, which I'm sure you know, but like, I don't know, this conversation isn't really like scripted or anything. So let's just go to the fact that even metropolitans, patriarchs, archdeacons, all these additional roles and even church vestments were different in the early centuries so and monasticism didn't exist in the first centuries like not uh, official tonsureship didn't exist now a lot of things didn't exist in the early centuries of christianity now that's completely different discussion so we're not necessarily saying that just because symphonia as described by saint justinian the roman emperor uh, didn't exist therefore you know it, it, it cannot exist say in the bolshevik period and that somehow legitimizes the communist exist. u.s society the absence of right that but how does the, yeah, the absence is a problem, right? It's a problem. Well, just okay, wait, hold on. You could say, you yeah, could say it's on. a problem. I'm not sure what the practical consequences of that are supposed to mean, but you could say it's a problem. But how is it, again, that the Bolsheviks cannot fulfill the same functions according to Orthodox theology that the czars did? That's what I really want to get to here. You can call okay, saying, that there are, saying that there are problems 
Well, I'm sure you would agree there are problems with Peter the Great and others ours as well. So what what does it mean to say there's a problem? Well, okay. Conrad, do you want to go or shall I? I'm well, getting I some firstly, water. But, I mean, I, I, just, I just had a drink, but I can answer. Uh, have you a drink? I feel, yeah, sure. Go on. No, hold on. I can answer this. But the difference being that there's, we don't, I don't, I would not, in the sense that the government after Lenin, after the Bolsheviks and everything, it's not that I believe that that government should have immediately been overthrown by a revolution per se. I believe that the government that was legitimate before that was overthrown by a revolution, that revolution was illegitimate, one, because it was a revolution in and of itself in that regard, and because inherent in that revolution was the overthrow of a divinely anointed sovereign in the, the liturgy and the anointing of the czar is a very is almost considered a sacrament of the church okay, to be clear itself. to be clear this does not only happen in revolutions it also happens in the interfighting between claimants to the throne like during the time of troubles so but but that yes, did we, not are, prevent, we understand that hold on but that the did difference not, but being that did the, not the fundamental hold on one thing i'll let you go the ins the fundamental institution of the monarchy and the emperor was abolished. I understand that in form you may believe it was preserved, and I believe that too. And that in many ways, God allowed that form to be safe, to be to exist to prevent Western liberalism from creeping in. That doesn't mean that it's exact and that it's actual, and that someone can adequately say that that was a godly, God ordained government in the same way that the emperor was. But why not? Is the question. Okay, so I, I just it, explained it. I don't know what else there is. But on, you didn't because because immediately what I'm trying to get at here is that if czars can be overthrown in the time of troubles and that doesn't stop the Orthodox Church from being loyal to them, is it just the fact that Stalin didn't call himself a czar formally? Is it just the etymology of it? Like what specifically rendered Stalin incapable of being treated in the same way a czar would. Well, but first of all, well, yes. First of all, first of all, I want to be clear about something because this is kind of getting lost mm. in the actual history of what happened. Stalin was. Oh, dude, treated dude, we that can't way. just. I'm, this isn't us giving you a platform to give yeah. your version of history. No, 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 no. I can. I, I have come loaded with receipts here about what the pa the patriarch, the patri whatever it's called, was was reconstituted yeah. under Stalin and what they had to say about Stalin while he was living and while they were eulogizing for him, it's very clear that the Russian Orthodox Church was in fact loyal to the Soviet government, especially under Stalin, where they okay. even arguably became enthusiastic moral guides of Stalinist rule. Like they actually so, not only were loyal to Stalin in the sense that they weren't rebelling against him. They were loyal to the government, yes. They were yes. actively and to Stalin fulfilling as they were actively fulfilling the aims of the Soviet state under Stalin specifically. I mean in many ways you can see Metropolitan Anufri, right? The head of the canonical Ukrainian church doing the same with Zelensky now, even though so are you going to say Zelensky that the isn't... modern Russian Orthodox Church's lineage is illegitimate? Because you just used the example. No, I, hold, wait, on, hold on, you, 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 you don't know about Sergianism. Hold on, hold on. Do, wait, wait a do you second, know what Sergianism is? Wait a second. Uh, yeah, we're hold not on, speaking on, about wait a second. But you just kind of contradicted that's... yourself because you compared the Russian Orthodox Church's loyalty to Stalin as what's going okay. on in Ukraine with the the church with Zelensky. Yeah, no, well, well, but then no, no, why? But then hold on. No. But then first of all, yes. then you have to somehow break the lineage of the Russian Orthodox Church and say, yeah, at this point it was illegitimate, but for some reason the heaps of praise. Okay, I never on, said. Okay, but you mentioned well, all of these saints. Firstly, okay? You just mentioned all of these Orthodox. Stop interrupting. Stop. Interrupting. No, no. Let Stop. me finish. Has, let me finish listen, this. Let me point out the. I have, I have to point out the history. argument before I say anything. Okay, I have to point out the argument okay, before just, I say anything. You just mentioned uh, sure. earlier how there is all these Russian saints and all <laughs> these, um, you know these bishops and stuff yes. that were heaping praises and that were loyal to the Romanov dynasty. But for some reason, when they're loyal to Stalin, that that's similar to what's going on with Zelensky. So can you explain that? All righty. All right. Well, let's start from the fact that yes, Orthodox clergymen can actually support certain rulers, secular rulers who aren't necessarily the good guys, right? You can see that's in Metropolitan Anufri, who is the Russian. So he's is on Patriarch Kirill and, Vladimir Putin's side, he actively supported Zelensky, right? And we're not saying this is somehow commendable or good. We're just, and no, notice we're not questioning his legitimacy, are we, Conrad? We're not saying Metropolitan Anufri and the Ukrainian church is somehow, you know, in this big, you know, it's a big paradox. Now, no, we're just saying, like, this is what happens under political pressure. The church sometimes bends to the will of the political side, right? 
Like this is what happened under Stalin as well. We don't deny that. So how do you distinguish... There, hold on. Well, I'll say hold one on. thing. I'll say one thing. Okay. Uh, one thing, and then you'll go. This, there are no canonized saints that the way that the Romanovs were venerated and praised and held up the way that Stalin was. There's even an entire... The church that even Dmitry is part of, the Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia, didn't even commemorate the Patriarch of Moscow until 2007. Okay. Because well, the they're compromised, okay. they felt that their compromises okay. to the Soviet government compromised their orthodoxy. Okay. And I understand you think here, the Russian Orthodox the Church outside of Russia is the, CIA, I have, I have but that's just not. That's, that's there's several arguments. I don't want to forget about what I was going to address. What Canonist sure. just said. Okay, so Canonist, you just I, I was hot and ready before you interrupted me to, to to make this argument right out of the oven. What what exactly did you say again, Canonist? Because his interruption kind of made me forgot what I was going to say. Okay, well, what I'm saying is the church throughout its history at times did support, say, okay, I, I got it, I got it, I got it, bad governments. Okay? Yeah, yeah governments I don't know, I, got, I remember what I was going to say. All the, so how do you right. distinguish then? Okay, I remember what you said. How do you distinguish sure. then the difference between being under political pressure? from enthusiastic support because conrad said well under the romanov dynasty which lasted 300 years there's this whole history of saints having loyalty and veneration for the romanovs the problem is that stalin ruled for what 20 years so how is that comparable stalin didn't have a dynasty that lasted 300 years you're going to tell me there wasn't political pressure under that 300 year dynasty for the orthodox church to politically um to have political I, pressure i never to said loyal Listen, to the government has 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 i never said the political pressure was somehow a bad thing it's just the reality it's a matter of fact orthodox like you read this right. in the apostle paul's so writings. but we orthodox... were back to square one then how is no, it no, we're not. Well, let me don't interrupt me please, please don't interrupt man please like, let, I let me finish. Right, or, orthodox clergymen orthodox clergymen orthodox churchmen and if any other orthodox person wants to challenge me on this you'll get your cheeks clapped like you can you can request to speak okay you better come with receipts as well citations exegesis references to church saints okay so if anyone wants to put up their hand you're welcome but Orthodox, the orthodox church has always supported uh, in the majority of cases the particular government in which you know in whose country it resided okay this is why saint nicholas of japan supported the japanese pagan emperor during the russo-japanese war now you may say hey, that's weird but he's not even ethnically japanese why did he pray for the emperor it's well because he's serving his japanese people okay that See, this is what happened in the Soviet Union. It is correct. The Russian church should have prayed for Stalin and it should have prayed for Lenin as well, frankly. And, the, and that's what and they did. The Orthodox Church never stopped praying for the Bolshevik government, even in the 20s and 30s. Right? Okay, so, like, I mean, th this is the reality here. And, and for the Romanovs as well, except but the, what the Romanovs have won up over the Bolsheviks and communists, right? And even Stalin, right? What they do have and what the communists did not is they were also Orthodox anointed sires and an actual dynasty which is recognized in the church, in the saints, in the sayings of the clergymen. So that's that gives them a huge one up. And that's what the communists, unfortunately, never gain. Like Stalin, yes, and I agree, even Dugin and Dugin's friend, now deceased, Vladimir Karpets, he does mention, he says, well, if Stalin in the 50s or after World War II actually proposed to the church, hey, could you guys make me a, a, you know, a Tsar? The church would probably say yes, if he had repented. Like that was a possibility, but Stalin did not pursue it. Okay? Yeah, okay, again. Um... I think we're kind of getting lost as far as what the argument is supposed to be here, because I agree that it's true that the Romanovs officiated the status of the church in the for the Russian state in ways that the Bolsheviks did not. But that has yet to explain exactly why it is. Again, so you're saying, OK, even Lenin was legitimate for the Russian Orthodox Church. I never said legitimate. I Legitimacy isn't in question. I can't comment on legitimacy. So you're or saying the Russian that. Orthodox Church yes. should have been loyal to Lenin, right? No, well, they were. <laughs> like, yeah. Factor, they were. Okay, loyal but, to then, Lenin. but then, but so, then, but at the same time, you say that Lenin was a Satanist and so on. So how does you square that? Yes. Well, that's the thing. Yes, theoretically, they shouldn't have been, but they were. Unfortunately, they didn't support the White Army during the. The majority so, but you're closing. saying they should have. Yes. Can you understand yes, that it's important? Can you understand that it's important to us that Tsar Nicholas would take communion every Sunday and that yeah, like the, and that Lenin thing. didn't believe in yeah, Jesus? Yeah. Listen, I, I, I'm not like, one like, to even Stalin yeah. believed in the importance of respecting ritual and not desecrating things that people find holy. I'm not saying that's that's all meaningless. I'm just saying 
given the way that has you... that has fundamental meaning to us about how someone okay, should sure. or shouldn't be perceived epistemologically by the church or by someone who calls. But I find that I find that a historical though, because according to you, someone can follow all of the motions of of being religious and so on. But in actual content on a world historical level, can, for example, be serving the Freemasonic bankers of the West and the Satanists. Can you name me that person? Like, was there a person in history? Like, I can actually, you know, I can name a couple, but can you? And you're going to say Peter, but sure. What? Yeah, the, ball, the ball is in your court. Can you name a certain person who actually embodied that ideal of deceptive order? Before that, it was even more than that. Like, there's like, this, there's sure. the, the fact that there's... Because of somebody, it's not that we're judging Lenin and saying that this person, like he and me and him are going to face God the same way and face the same judgment. We're talking about the, the, this debate started because I don't believe that someone can adequately call himself a communist in that way in regards to the Russian Orthodox tradition okay. that could be Why consistent not? as someone who's a monarchist, as someone who's a Rome, as a, who believes in the legitimacy of the Romanov dynasty, who believes that actually in the next 50 years we could can, see a revolution. Please get to the point. Um, Okay, dude, you do tell me to get to the point, man. You know how much I listen to you ramble in this whole space. Yeah, you'll just need to be patient, Hugs, okay? Dude, like, you you can just leave whenever you want, okay? <laughs> like, that's that's one thing. I mean, I'm, like, and debating the, uh, with three people at once, and you just, like... Two people. Dude, we, yeah. you're, you're here because your friend couldn't make a point. You're his big brother here to defend your buddy. Okay, so, well, it's... Okay, fine. I'm just, I'm like, it's like you guys are I'm taking saying, turns. A individual really czar can right be a problem. Please, they can even try, go to hell in afterwards, good faith, but in the good fact faith. is... The right, system faith, of government in good faith, is, has its basis in the institution that the church has historically supported in that regard, sacramentally. Can you repeat that again? I'm saying, even if the czar is bad, even if Stalin, you could say, is a materially better ruler, even a morally better man, between the revolutionary basis of the regime, his re as Dimitri said, he never approached the church, approaching it as a czar, as someone who is seeking symphonia. And again, the sacramental element with the ordination of the czar, his lifetime in communion with the church. This goes back to the story of people like Saint, uh, who is it, Saint Jerome and Saint, and that's the Emperor right, Theodosius yeah. and whatnot. This is a this is a story that's often spoken. Of, um, and I'm really not trying to just say you with stuff that you don't understand. I, I, I this is how I speak in the context okay. of the world that I know so, about. But this is uh, I, I'm I'm going to try and get to the sim simple point that I can parse out from there. What you're basically trying to say is that. Despite the fact that the Soviet government in actual content was better. I'm not saying that. I'm just granting okay. you that for argument. So for the purposes of argumentation, sure. Even if, for example, the Soviet government safeguarded Russian civilization from the Satanism, the actual Satanism that we now see fully in power in the West, despite that fact, this um, still would not have been as good as if God decided for the czars who were indebted to the French banks uh, to rule just because the czars formally... You're loading the question, but like, in an, just because epistem... Just say epistemologically... Yes, no, no, let me fact, finish what, what, what I fucking what, said. Don't interrupt me, okay? I thought you were done, dude. No, I thought I, you were I'm done. I'm not fucking done. I've been really patient with you, so don't fucking interrupt me. I'm trying to I make this I can kick you simple. out of the space whenever I want, man. Okay, Please, well, I'm just trying give to me make a this, well, Then you would concede the debate to me, because I'm just trying to make this oh, simple, yeah, yeah. okay? I'm trying make to make this point. fucking simple. Even for the purpose... Of, for, so basically, what you're saying, for the sake of argument, all that matters is that they're following the formal procedures of religion. They're not actually embodying the spirit of the law, they're not actually embodying the spirit of the religion in actual real content. All they have to do is follow all the fucking formal procedures and you're saying that makes them holier than thou and that makes them better. That's basically what you're getting at. That's not what I'm saying. The, the, at the end, I never once said that the, there's a, like, there's still problems in the government. You can be, like, this idea that the government always has to reflect the idealistic ideology of like the, the best situation. That's just not realistic. We've already explained that we believe dude, that dude. Stalin and the... Let me finish. Holy fuck, dude. Let me finish. You just bitched out about everyone interrupting and this is... You are here as... This is our space, dude. This is We're here to hey, talk about ahead, World War with, III. We're entertaining MAGA communism, okay? Please just let me finish this. We are saying... Even in Israel, in the ancient Israeli context of the Bible, we would say that the Assyrian Empire, the Babylonian Empire, pagan, satanic, they served as scourges of God against the, 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 the people of Israel, God's anointed people, who were being scourged for their paganism, their Satanism. 
the communist was a punishment for the Freemasonry among the Russian people, among the Russian aristocracy, among those things. That's all true. That does not delegitimize the czar. And all of that institution has been preserved by the church, which is our epistemological foundation in many ways in the canonization of Tsar Nicholas II and his family, in the recognition of those things by the current Russian government in many ways as well. And I, again, this in this many way, in the way that the church has spoken and the way it's condemned Lenin and those ways, I cannot say that Lenin is an Orthodox Christian. Stalin is a somewhat different story, but my opinion is still that no, he was not an Orthodox Christian and the most charitable interpretation of him in the church is that he repented before he died. So everything you just said, Conrad, that's, that's, so everything you just said, Conrad, is exactly what say Patriarch Kirill and the majority of the Russian clergymen actually believe in, right? Which, which is what I'm getting at. It's not just well, Orthodox canonist and Gnomrad, their opinion. No, no, no. In particular, this is the opinion of the Russian church and the of the entire global Orthodox Christian church. So, I mean, yeah, we just have to contend with that. And also, has I mean, generally speaking, I would ask if any of your historians are listening, and I mean by your historians, I mean colleagues of yours who are into Russian history, I challenge them to find ways that they could somehow delegitimize the Romanovs collectively as a dynasty from an Orthodox Christian perspective. Because, frankly, I've tried, and I couldn't find the receipts. I couldn't find any archival documents. None of the saints speak ill of them, actually. Right? And they do, yeah, they do say, well, Peter the Great made mistakes. Catherine the Great, yes. Catherine the Great made mistakes. But speak not, ill of who? But it doesn't sorry. speak ill of the Romanovs, sorry. The, the dynasty in question here, okay? But what's, what Conrad's saying is you can find... Patriarchia.ru, the main Patriarch Kirill's website, Patriarch Kirill, thinks, uh, you know, Metropolitan Tikhonov's book, Putin's Confessor, the guy who takes Putin to confession and hears his sins, this is what they believe in. This is not some bro science, this is not some Hassan Piker garbage that you hear on Twitch, okay? This is like real life orthodox political thought slash orthodox. And let me just give one practical example and I'll let you speak, Haas. In the, in the scriptures, we wouldn't believe that there would be a legitimate basis for overthrowing King Saul, who was completely, fu- he was he was anointed with a follow-up king. There was no revolution that was necessary to overthrow him necessarily in that regard. In the same way that the next king, if they were to become morally corrupt, we wouldn't believe in doing a revolution and enforcing some kind of ideology about, about dialectics or whatever, not modern, whatever it is that at the time would manifest itself among the people or among those discontent, Basic, we wouldn't believe that that would be something that would be a Christian thing to do. God brings about plague and persecution and other things, or, you know, he will bring about a time of, even in the time when there was no king, he still appointed and anointed the judges. This is just how the true, like, people who take the scriptures and epistemology and their Christian faith seriously, this is how we, and we've explicated this on our show, like, we have hours and hours of content explicating this right. idea. So, um, I, I but, think that we're sometimes forgetting that, I'm not saying you're, this is a problem for you, you just haven't listened to any of our content, so I apologize if I assumed anything. Conrad, would you say that, like, Putin would be a Tsar? Like, because in my opinion, he wouldn't be, obviously. He would uh, be... Are we going to actually, like, like have this style, debate, right? or are we just going to... Oh, sure, sure. I yeah, just thought you because muted. there's a lot you said that. that I kind of want to respond to, unless I'm not allowed to respond. You but, are, you are. Yeah, Take I mean, time. you talked about the, oh, well, we wouldn't, we wouldn't even be against the overthrow of the Assyrians and the Babylonians and stuff. Then just admit that you're not, you, you can't really have a real political role, that you're just focused on the church, you just want to pray all day, and that's fine. I respect that, right? But the problem is when you start to make political interventions condemning Lenin and condemning communism and stuff, I just don't see how it's legitimate. If you, I mean, it's it's like a retro causality. In the time you say in the time of troubles, we don't support the deposition of a monarch. But after the monarch gets deposed, you rally behind the new monarch and the story they tell as far as the basis of their legitimacy. It's always happened throughout the history of the church every time, right? So, and it, it also happened under the Romanovs. Who's to say? I mean, you're also saying, oh, I haven't found any people in the Russian Orthodox Church who condemn the Romanovs. No, we haven't. Well, okay. E- even even if I grant you that for the sake of argument, that there was no like real criticism. Of I'll, I'll, bet you, I'll bet you $1,000 American USD right now in Bitcoin. If you can find me, two or three saints that support your position okay, on the Romanovs. Go on, go on. Sorry, I needed to say that. Just like we're willing to put money on the line, all right? Twitch box, whatever you want. Okay, go on. Sorry. All right. So, even if I granted that for the sake of argument, I think you're, and I'm not trying to insult you, but it kind of sounds like you're coming from a Catholic or West Christian background where you're making this assumption 
that the Russian, the, what people say in the Russian Orthodox Church is infallible in the same way as like what the edicts of the Catholic Church or what the Pope says, which is not really necessarily true. The functions of the Orthodox Church have always been bound by time, space, and circumstance. It's possible for people to have been wrong, and it's possible for new perspectives to emerge that have not emerged in the past. So I don't really see what's so significant, about, even if it's true that there's this unanimous consensus right now that, yeah, the Romanovs were not, you know, um, didn't harm orthodoxy or something. I don't know. I feel I feel like it's not necessarily even a religious edict. I feel like it's more. Well, can I could, can no, I contextualize the because I let you guys talk for like thirty minutes, all right? And then there's other things you said, which is, for example, when it came to okay, maybe Stalin was not orthodox sorry maybe stalin it's a complicated story but for lenin you can't call him an orthodox christian well obviously consciously he wasn't but just look at how priests and religious figures within the ussr talked about lenin looked about how they talked that you know uh for example that lenin that communism has its roots in the teachings of christ and that Christ was the first communist, and that Lenin was a religious person. Look at the example of people who say things like, uh, in the poem, which was made by Demian Bed Bedni, that's his name, I can't really pronounce it correct. It was called To the Leader, and it said, Lenin's writings are the holy Bible of labor, castigated Lenin's enemies as Judas's, several leading Bolsheviks were among his friends, they saw uh, other secular poets, right? They're, again, it's this biblical unconscious, identifying the October Revolution, the second coming of Christ, all of this kind of religiosity latent in the language and the contextual background of the, the communist ideology, which is this kind of rooted in this Christian messianism, right? Now, you can say you don't find it legitimate for this revolution to happen. That's fine. But it did happen. So how do you dispense judgment is the question. And I feel like the way you're dispensing judgment on it contradicts how the Russian Orthodox Church, especially after World War II, actually ended up doing that. For example, uh, one last example I want to read out. Um, this is from, this is from uh, the Journal of the Moscow Patriarch, Patriarchate, right? 1960. Sorry, this is from Archbishop, Archbishop Nikodim. 1963. Many reject communism because it's linked to the deadly sin of atheism, but they forget about the atheism within the bones of any given society. An objective examination of atheism reveals the need to distinguish the motives leading to the atheist worldview. Communist atheism represents a system of convictions, moral principles that do not contradict Christian norms. A different kind of atheism, blasphemous and immoral, arises from the wish to live independently of divine law of truth, which was present in the depth of the old society and which often appeared on the fertile soil of the luxurious and demoralized lifestyle of the ruling classes. Christian teaching considers atheism a second type of mortal sin, but looks differently on Marxist atheism. This was the Archbishop of the Russian Orthodox Church in 1963. Yeah, look, we... I guess I'll just make the point. Um, I understand Archbishop Nikodim Rotov's opinions. He's the spiritual father of Petra Kirill. He's the one who actually promoted Petra Kirill into clergy in the first place. So I'm not saying he was a he was a bad person of any sort, but he had specific opinions. He's not a canonized saint. He's just one of these bishops. Same as there's, you know, there's the Archbishop Elpidophorus in the Greek church who is, uh, you know, marching with BLM and things like that in the U.S. now. Like, so the fallible opinions of certain individual bishops, and even I would grant Archbishop Nicodem was in the 1960s during the Khrushchev era. This is a time of still of continued soft persecution and which i mean in i'm not going to go into this subject too heavily but it is a period which we define as surgeonist okay i'm not saying it's the whole russian church lost legitimacy because of this but it was a very intense period similar to how the ecumenical patriarchs of constantinople were under the turkish yoke in the 15 and 1600s so was the russian church under a very intense soviet communist yoke in the 60s, 50s, I would say even from 1945 onwards until maybe the early 80s. So, you can see Morotov's opinion, yes. Notice how he doesn't cite any saints, mind you, Haas. Notice he doesn't cite scripture or even scriptural exegesis. It's because his opinions are novel and they're kind of personal. How do you know he personal. doesn't cite anyone? 
because I can just, yep. Yeah. Oh, how do I know? I'm taking a guess. But am I correct? Because I know Archbishop Dinipa Dimirotov, I've read his works. So I'm guessing he's kind of just stating his own opinions, which are fine. He can have them as, a, as an individual clergyman. That's fine. I was just going to make the point, Haas, again, I'm not, we aren't saying that, again, I'll just give an example. Dmitry is part of the Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia. The church, in, in, we don't, in the sense we don't believe in papal infallibility, we believe the church is synodally local. The patriarch, not in the sense that he can speak literally infallibly on behalf of God, but he is the archbishop, the local bishop, and the church is, we believe, the pillar and ground of truth. That's just basic scripture. And to say that what the church says not to say that everything the bishop says is infallible, but when you submit yourself to the tradition of the church, that doesn't mean that you can just, because of our political opinions, throw aside. If you're in the Russian church, your synod has anathematized somebody. Your synod has said this kind of thing. And again, you I understand that you're not a Christian, so this isn't going to convince you very much, and that's fine. But like from our epistemological perspective, that's not just something that can be swept aside. And from a governmental perspective, there's also the entire argument, and again, I'm not just trying to derail this, but like, we have the quote from St. John of Kronstadt that he heaven is a kingdom, hell is a democracy. And obviously you don't believe in democracy. You wouldn't say anything that you believe in liberal democracy, Western democracy, and your vision of what Stalin was is much more close to our form of government. But that's also a faction of the communist perspective and a co of the communist belief. And in many ways, there are those who, I'm sure you know this, you fight them all the time. I've seen a lot of your streams, like these, what you consider these Democrats LARPing as what you would consider, you know, true Marxist, true carriers on of that dialectics. And it's hard for us to, it, it, we're just not going, from my, I'm just not, especially with the current state of the question, where I can see as Russia is in this transition, as the church is re-emerging, re I'm going to stake myself towards the monarchist tradition of the church as opposed to quote-unquote based communism. That's, that's, that was how, what was the, I think that's returning this to the original question that was at hand here. Right, but my, my issue here is that, um, I kind of forgot what you originally said. I forgot how I was going to respond to that. Give me a second to think. We're all tired. I also, we can't do this forever. It's getting late. I have work in okay, the morning. Let, let, me, so. let me try to remember what the Orthodox canon has said. Because I had I have something to Just say. Just about the Archbishop. Mostly about oh, Archbishop. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. My issue is that I feel like you're kind of picking and choosing when it comes to what constitutes infallibility. Now, you're not directly saying that saints are infallible. But you're just basically drawing from the fact that, well, there are no saints that have ever he's drawn from to corroborate this. Well, Soviet communism lasted 70 years compared to the 300 years under the Romanovs. So a lot of this is just a matter of time. And also, it's an unfinished reconciliation, in my opinion, between communism and Christianity, which people like the leader of the Communist Party of the Russian Federation, Zayuganov, is trying to kind of Zyuganov, fulfill. Yeah. Zayuganov was given the award by uh, Patriarch Kirill, or Kirill, I don't know how to exactly pronounce it, um, say it. And he was given an award, uh, the Order of Glory and Honor, for preserving the values of faith, morality, culture, unity of the people, and, uh, uh, and you know, basic traditional values. The basic um, fundamental values that he says define the life of the country. So there's a collaboration going on right now between the Communist Party politically in the Russian Orthodox Church, overwhelming majority of communists within Russia are devout Christians um, who are part of the Russian Orthodox faith. So I to say that, oh, well, the monarchist tradition is more legitimate, well, well, look what reality says. There are more communists, they are more politically relevant within Russia than monarchists are. The communists are the second largest party outside of United Russia within the Russian Federation. So to discount this and just to throw this under the table because of the overwhelming phenomena of this kind of minority of psychotic Western liberals calling themselves communists. I mean, look at the numbers. The Russian Orthodox Church, sorry, the Russian Communist Party is huge. It's like it's the largest non-governing communist party in the world, right? You look at America. Yeah, I, I would count maybe max 20,000 so-called communists in America. Max, right? Um, and these are just the tail end of the psychotic liberals. Now, they've adopted communism because of the Red Scare edginess associated with it for the same reason someone would adopt Satanism. They're just doing it to provoke and scare their parents. It's not actually rooted in any authentic communist tradition. And to prove, I don't want to ramble, but to prove that, one last final thing, even the so-called communist 
the Communist Party right now in the rank and file. They don't even draw from the immediate communist tradition of fucking William Z. Foster and the Communist Party throughout the 60s and 50s because they reject American patriotism and say American patriotism is completely illegitimate, even though it was an orthodox communist line for like the entirety of its existence. So these are not actual real communists. It's not even just that they're Western communists. They're not even real Western communists either. It's a complete invention of liberalism. I know they're more prominent on Twitter and on the internet, but in the real world, it's the Communist Party of the Russian Federation and the Chinese Communist Party that represents what communists are way more. I just find it a bit funny that you're saying that we're like picking and choosing when for every like person that you can sort of quote, um, that's some, you know, it's not a saint, not, um, uh, you know, not a saint and not citing any specific scripture or saints who saying some things that are, you know, re relatively mild towards um, communism or not explicitly denouncing it. It's like we can have, we, we, we can cite literally thousands, hundreds of thousands, hundreds of saints who are saying the most vehement things against Marxism, calling it like, um, you know, the coming of the Antichrist and all these things. We can show you all the icons in our churches that show, um, that depict um, people like Lenin in a negative light. Like we can show you all these things. So it's, I don't know why you're saying that we're picking and choosing, given the fact that we can give you like a, you know, endless, endless tomes of people who are actually saints on their way to sainthood or are locally venerated um, in some areas um, who are explicitly denouncing um, Marxism, Stalinism, etc. I didn't want to get the debate too meta, but like this was, I was trying to explain our, it's our epistemology, like the consensus patrum, the, the count, the synod councils and synodality, the, 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 the ecumenical councils themselves. These are our, this is our epistemology and our epistemology through history is the consensus patrum, the consensus of the saints. And the hypothetical fact that communism could have reconciled with Christianity after it fell is irrelevant to me as the saints have spoken th on this as of now. And maybe if, look, if communism comes back and it happens exactly how you want it, maybe this conversation will, will become more relevant. But I don't necessarily see that happening either. Right, but you have to appreciate the significance of the actual Communist Party of the Russian Federation which is overwhelmingly Christian Orthodox. The leader, Zayuganov, is a devout Orthodox believer who's friends with Patriarch Kirill. So I don't think this is necessarily unlikely that the future of communism is going to be religious, or at least in the Russian form, it's going to be Orthodox religious. Now, finally, what I wanted to say was, isn't it possible that there could be nuance here? Isn't it possible that the... I understand there's a mixed feeling toward Lenin, at least within the Orthodox Church, and I do think mostly negative. I, I'll concede that to you. Among most Orthodox leaders, negative do Lenin does have a negative uh, connotation. But can't there also be nuance here? Can it also be that Lenin also represents an internal religious strife within the Russian soul? After all, Russia is a collectivistic society. Lenin is considered evil and satanic and demonic, but when you compare Lenin uh, to the actual... Western liberalism, and when you compare that to, you know, so-called liberal democracy, I mean, there was an upfront, outward atheism in the Soviet Union that I don't necessarily to have been considered draw gone from religion. It was an internal religious strife. It was an explicit manifestation of religious doubt that still was in, with, within the realm of the soul's searching and longing for meaning. Contrast that to America in the West, where you can have churches be prominent and it doesn't matter because in the fundamental texture of the society's culture, that search for meaning is gone. It's not simply that people are atheists. They are devoid of the guiding principle of, of uh, any divinity. They're devoid of God. It's complete debauchery. It's complete immorality. It's complete madness. It's pedophilia. It's evil, fundamental sinister evil. Man exploiting man like an animal so on and so on. I mean, it's unlimited prostitution, evil, drugs, debauchery. I think the explicit atheism of the Soviet state, which you could easily say was within the journey of Russia really consolidating its faith, cannot really be compared to the actual objective atheism you see in the West. So none of us are saying that, you know, none of us are apologists here for the West. Um, okay, first off, and then going on to that, when you're talking about the explicit atheism of the of the of the Russian uh, state under um, communism, there you make it sound as if the issue is 
that it's like sort of the Russian people have lost the religion and the communists there are just sort of tap or they're, they're just sort of like a reflection of the people um, in a way. Um, and, and it's just sort of like outgrowth of that. But if communism could have, if the USSR sort of stayed around in the next couple hundred years or hundred years or so, whatever it would be, then they, they would adapt to more sort of religious trappings. But, you know, going back to like, even like Lenin's writings, for instance, the 1905 pamphlet, Socialism and Religion, or Lenin's like explicitly denouncing Christianity, and he says that you would need to take up the advice of Engels and disseminate among the working class the literature of the century, French enlighteners and atheists, and looking at the things that people like you know people of Marx and Engels have said about religion, which you yourself have said in the past is in necessarily the appropriate way. Um, I think it's very obvious that there's not just a um, that, that that the leadership of the USSR with various leaders wasn't just merely a reflection of the poor spirituality of the Russian people or something like that, but rather, I mean, maybe it was to an extent, I'm willing to um, ascertain that to some degree, but more fundamentally, I think it root derives from like the ideological implications of people like Marx, Engels, Lenin. And, and also just well, one other point I wanted to make was that um, there are people like, for instance, I don't know if you're aware of, I know I might get in trouble for this with uh, Conrad and uh, 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 Dimitri here, but people like him, Sergei Bulgakov, he actually was a, um, a, a Marxist Leninist himself. Right. For, for a very long time, he was. He wrote like whole like books about it and stuff like that. I think even Lenin at one point, you know, cites him as like, this like great, you know, comrade or something like that. But then uh, some events happen in his life and then he becomes a, you know, he ends up becoming a priest. Um, he actually he actually gets ordained a priest um, on the eve of. Uh, I think in like 1916, like, you know, very shortly before the uh, revolution, then he has to move out. But even someone like him, um, just to, I guess to kind of give you some credence here, says that in a way that Marxism, that, that coming about, it's a, it's a poor reflection on us because we as Christians could have done more to um, sort of stop that by having a more sort of robust political ideology. So on that level, um, that, you know, that, you know, address the problems of modernity. So on that level, I guess I would agree with you, but I think that fundamentally the, athe the atheism of the USSR and of Marxism is inherent to it and to the extent that it would go away in the few, in the next hundred years or so, or a few hundred years, if it were to last would not be because it's adhering still to the, the, um, the doctrine, the dogmas of Marxism, um, but rather because it has fundamentally changed its ideology. And even though it might still call itself the Communist Party, the Soviet Union or Russia or whatever, it would be a fundamentally different ideological thing that would not be compatible with the humanism of Marxism. I just, the issue here is that why can't we just look to the words of Archbishop Nikodim? Because for him, the well, why can't we look to the word? Because he's not a saint. I, 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 I wanted to interrupt you, but I didn't. I let you speak, so let me speak. Okay, okay. go. You said, oh, it's not that it was a reflection of Russian society because Lenin actively wanted to propagate atheistic propaganda and, you know, the French Enlightenment and so on. But you're assuming that the root cause of this is still coming from ideology, and it's not. According to Archbishop Nicodem, right? the depths of the old society, and it was the fertile so soil of the luxurious and demoralized lifestyle of the ruling classes. And you, know, I, I'm, I'm willing to bet that among the Orthodox clergy in Soviet times, they will point to the sinful nature of capitalism's influence. So on a fundamental level of the way the people's lifestyle is, right, that is where it's coming from. It's not coming from some ideology that's being disseminated. It's coming from the fact that people are becoming atheistic in practice, in actual practice. The dog-eat-dog -dog barbaric, every man for himself, sell out your mother, sell out your sons and daughters. That kind of capitalist system was in practical effect being imported to the Russian Empire. And this completely turned everything upside down. Even if you don't say you're an atheist, the atheism is there. And that was noted pretty explicitly by Archbishop Nikodem. Now, my problem here is that I feel like there's a kind of double standard where on the one hand, you'll say, okay, well, the reason the church supported this at this time is because they were bound by time and circumstance, and he, it was just Khrushchev's political thought and so on and so forth. But it's not possible to apply the same standard for Marxism and say, well, the reason Marxists were just so fervent atheists at this time wasn't necessarily because of the context of what religiosity had meant in practice at this time. It's because of some kind of like fundamental metaphysical atheism. And I just I just reject that. I think you look at the moral values, you look at the un like the basic sensibilities of these communists. Felix Zerzhinsky, you know, the knight of the proletariat. These people 
were far more moral. I mean, look at Stalin's ascetic lifestyle, for example. This was a fundamental um, biblical unconscious. I cannot really, knowing what I know about Soviet history, it's just ahistorical to say it's like this, it's this inevitable metaphysical atheism rather than a specific kind of struggle internal to re the religious soul. No, I think it is very explicit. I mean, if you read people like Marx, Lenin, and Engels, they're very explicit about their views of religion. You can say, oh, no, they're just talking about religion of their time. But where do they ever explicitly talk about, oh, no, well, we're just talking about, you know, the sort of false form of religion. But we like that true source of, source of religion. To the extent that Marxism has a true sort of religious core to it, I would go to Walter Benjamin and say, yeah, it's just like Kabbalah with no Yahweh. Yeah, I, I don't think so, because I'm not saying that Marx and Engels and Lenin said, oh, yeah, we believe in the true religious core. I don't think they ever said that explicitly. I'm trying to say they lived that throughout their entire life, their basic moral sensibilities, their basic aesthetic. When I say aesthetic, I don't mean cosmetic. I mean, like their sense of the world that you cannot deny there's a fundamental biblical unconscious. So their materialism, there. like they're like, they're like, like, like the, their materialism. Is that what you're referring to? Like with their views of like, meta I mean, I know you have this no, sort of uh, weird view of their metaphysics or whatever. Hold on, but. hold on. You're still talking about like philosophy and ideology. I agree in that department. They didn't entertain religion in any capacity. I completely agree. But I'm just saying there's a lot they still in practice not only took for granted, but I would argue it had in material fact more of a proximate relationship to whether they were consciously aware of it or not with this fundamental biblical unconscious kind of moral bedrock this this fundamental sense of justice this fundamental commitment and loyalty to man who's the greatest of god's creation right you can say oh well marx was a materialism well, what does his materialism actually mean in practice in praxis all, all marx's materialism did was open the human hand right toward fighting for your fellow man that's what it actually did in practice materialism didn't mean oh metaphysically we're gonna blaspheme religion no it's, it's not even addressing the question of religion it's addressing the here and now of bringing justice on earth it's addressing the here and now of eradicating evil and and, and the day-to-day -day tasks the organization the understanding of how the economy works and so on and so on that are necessary to do that now, just because he's not mentioning religion doesn't mean it's not still implicit, whether he's aware of that even or not. I mean, yeah, I, I would agree. And that's why I cited people like, you know, Benjamin, who point, you know, things out like this. And but to the extent that they have this sort of uh, Christian ethos or religious ethos to them, I would say that's only because they're stealing from our epistemological worldview. No, and then, but then no. combining Benjamin, it with their materialism sorry, and their other humanism. I don't mean to interrupt, but Benjamin is an intellectual. Marx and Lenin are not stealing anything. They're doing it in practice. They're not even aware, necessarily, of how Christian what they're doing is. It's being done in practice. Benjamin can take note of this as an intellectual, but and you can say, oh, he stole a lot from the Christian tradition, but that's in his capacity as like a writer or someone who's just writing things. What about the political capacity of someone like Lenin? What about the fact that Lenin actually gave human recognition to the Russian people and to the to Slavs and others who never had any political status in the modern world whatsoever, that were slaves of European colonialism. What about the fact that he redeemed the humanity of these people and gave them political subjectivity? What about the fact that Marx, more than anyone else in his time, recognized and stood up for this proletariat that was robbed of its livelihood, that was deprived of its basic means of reproducing its existence, including its traditional existence, which was being having to sell its labor like a sheep has to sell its own skin. They were neglected. Nobody gave a fuck about them. This did not mean some kind of fundamental metaphysical injustice, even in the minds of a lot of these religious church leaders in England and in Europe at the time. It was Marx who attached pr a primary significance to this. I mean, you can say that's materialist, if some injustice is occurring to your family and your wife, if another man is trying to come for your wife and uh, harm your family, won't you call? Won't that be a call to action to you? Won't you have your fists clenched and rise to the occasion to defend the honor of your family? Why is it wrong to defend the honor of humanity as Marx did? Why does that make him a materialist too focused on worldly affairs? Why is it impossible to point out a fundamental injustice at the core of 
the world, right? Why is focusing on that necessarily a bad thing? I think that's more Christian because to me, to me, in my view, Christianity doesn't mean just praying and following all the rituals. Now, I believe in the wisdom of those rituals. I'm not saying they're nothing, but I believe walking the walk matters more, not just following the dead letter of the law, but the spirit of the law, which is something you do in practice. I don't know what, I'm sure Mom Shul might have one thing to say, but I want to make this one point, because it's about something you said a long, long, long time ago, and I just wanted to say it before I for, forget what I'm going to say about it. You talked about communism in Russian society. In my perspective, communism in Russia is kind of a lot like what neoconservatism or boomer conservatism is in America. I'm sure you have plenty of examples of some vanguard communist wing of the Russian party that you think is going to change the game, but I think... And Dmitry can cite this as well as a Russian. I think the, the it's in many ways that ideology is something that's held on to due to Soviet nostalgia for older people as a who then experienced the '90s and hated it, as opposed to an actual resurgence of what the future right. of Russian. But sociological. Let me let me let me just say one other thing. My only other point I was going to make was you also talked about Lenin and his spiritual struggle being symbolic of the Russian mind, and I'm not just saying this to be inflammatory, but. We're really sidestepping the entire Jewish angle of this entire civilizational struggle with, between Russia, the Church, and and the and the old Kav and uh, the Kazarians. So I think to talk sociologically and anthropologically there, I think that's to ignore that. I, I don't think we should. Yeah, even I'm not going to ignore. Not. I'm going to address it, but just want to be clear that the attachment of Russians to communism doesn't just have something to do with some vague nostalgia. It's actually rooted in their way of life, that they're living off of pensions. They're living in the infrastructure built under communism, and capitalism has not been able to materially reproduce all the things Russians take for granted now that were actually built under communism. Now, regarding this stuff you're saying about Jewish stuff, I mean, this is I find this to be completely anti-Christian. You could say, oh, Lenin, the accusation, which has never been proven, by the way, not that it would matter, is that Lenin had a quarter Jewish blood running through his veins. So what? What? I mean, even, I wouldn't mind saying, okay, Lenin was uh, theologically more Jewish than Christian, but Lenin was raised as a Christian, and his family was Christian. The so supposed Jewish person that's in his family tree converted to Christianity. Marx, his father converted to Christianity. Marx himself was an actual devout Christian. He wasn't faking it. You could see in the poems he wrote to Jesus Christ and so on and so on in his early life. So I think you're making like this racialist, not even a theologian. You've gone beyond the bounds of theology. You're talking about all this satanic racialist stuff that's informed by English vulgar materialism, according to which mankind... Please don't straw man me, bro. What? Just don't straw man me. I didn't say... Like, what, like, are you going to ignore the Christian tradition and Christian history's relationship with Jews? Uh, I can accept there's a theological conflict, just like there's a theological conflict between all of the great religions. There's a civilizational conflict. That's where you lose me. I don't see a civilizational conflict. Because here's the thing. No! Yeah, here's the problem. Here's the problem. <laughs> You're dealing with a situation. There's a theological conflict, not a civilizational one. Period. Wait, name me a fucking figure in the Orthodox tradition from 500 years ago. Who's, who's saying, yeah, this is a civilizational conflict with this small minority of religious people we disagree with. That's Let me read you a fun quote. Let me read you a fun quote. From what, <laughs> from what, Let me read you a fun... what, what year do you want? I'm confused. I want, because before the modern of, uh, before the invention of modern anti-Semitism, show Look me up where Adversos it was not just Judeos a theological By St. John Chrysostom. What's that? Look up, look up Adversus Judeos by St. John Chrysostom. What year was this? This is in the sixth century. So was this a was this a oh this is a civilizational conflict or was this a theological dispute? Civilization. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna guess it's a theological dispute. Okay. It's the, civilizational idea, the, the, the idea of a civilizational conflict comes from the racialist secular tradition. Hold on. It has nothing to do with religion. But I want to I want I wanted to get at though. No, you didn't even let him answer. I, no, no, no. I didn't answer because he was getting mistake, off the mic. Okay? What? You just give me a minute. You give me give me a second here, Has. Let me ask you, did the great civilizational, you know, empires of Christianity, did they have specific laws against Judaism and folks who were members of that community for centuries from the time of even a like, hundred years after Constantine, from the time of yeah, I'm aware the text of Conrad just mentioned. Are you aware of, of that? Okay. Also against Muslims. Also against Muslims. Oh, 
absolutely. But and also as much against as that's others. also a civilizational but conflict. Also, oh, of course, that, also, yep. also against agree. other Christians. What I'm trying to get at here is that in our era specifically, after we've gone through this problem of modernity, are we going to return to the barbarism according to which we're going to start attacking each other over our religion? Or can we accept now the conflict is between the world's traditional peoples and religions and this fundamental, actual atheistic Satanism that is devoid of any religious character that's on the other side? Why should I... Uh, speak ill of the Jews, Orthodox Jews in New York who are fighting against globalism and fighting against the Satanism, why should I make them my enemy? What about them makes them my enemy rather than my brother in humanity fighting in the same struggle alongside me? Because every Saturday the at the enemies? synagogue, they curse the Christians who read the prophecies of Daniel about our God listen, and Savior listen, you Jesus can, Christ. Listen, you can, you, can, I, I, you can talk to more scholarly, um, educated Jews about this theological dispute you want to have, but on a fundamental level, there are religious disagreements between Christians, Muslims, Jews, and even other religions, right? Why Theology that... is my civilizational epistemology, though. No, it's not yeah, your right. civilizational epistemology, yes. because Patriarch yes, Kirill... Yes, it is. Hold on. Patriarch Kirill in Russia has an understanding that he is in an alliance with the Muslims in Russia and with the Jewish religious leaders of Russia. They're, they are aligned together, they meet together, they coexist and they exchange dialogue. You're just doing some fucking stupid LARP where you're trying to take whoa, us whoa. back to some Whoa, bro, we get it. You don't it's want to talk LARP. about this because the you actual, dude, The actual out. Orthodox Christian authority in Russia does not share the view that you have on Jews. Yes, they do. No, they Look, don't. Patriarch because, Tico, Patriarch because they are Tico allied Scott. with... Patri they are allied Bro, don't with teach me about Orthodox, Orthodox Jewish Tico. religious leaders. No, so how could they have the same view as you? Show me the text where Patriarch Kirill, you know, visits a synagogue and actually speaks about. Besides just, the, you know, sitting at the same table. You want me to find water. evidence of Patriarch Kirill interacting I mean, yeah, positively? I can explain to you how Patriarch... Wait, Jews Mets can't Paulton's enter Tico. churches... That's part of Metropolitan the Metropolitan Tikhon of Skov, who is likely possible the successor to Patriarch, T to Patriarch Kirill, he's Putin's personal confessor, he attests the opinion of the Russian Orthodox Church being that the Tsar and his family were ritually murdered by Jews. That's the opinion, that's the current... Yeah, I'd, have, I'd, have to, I'd have to look Orthodox into Church. that. I'd have to look into yeah, that. Now because... you're source-checking. Now you're, now I, didn't, I wasn't getting into the nitty-gritty on all of the things you said that I totally don't believe. No, I mean, I and can't just accept what you're saying at face value, but even if I yeah. accepted it... For the sake of argument, that what even even if there's something said about the past that's negative about Jews, the fact of the matter is that here and now, this idea that Jews are a civilizational enemy of Christians is not accepted. It's not canon in the Russian Orthodox Church. You know, Russia closed the Jewish agency, right, about repatriations to Israel. <laughs> yeah, that is related to the political status of and foreign relations with the country of Israel not related to the status of the Jewish religion in Russia. So the Jewish religion, the Jewish state, and the Jewish people are not the Jewish civilization. I, no, I understand they're not, now. You're because perfectly plenty, coherent. Because there are <laughs> plenty of anti-Zionist Jews. That's what you're missing here. Even in Israel itself, still Jews. even in Israel itself, the Hasidic population resists conscription. Why the fuck am I fuck. Hold on, give me a sec. It kicked me out of the space. Did I get kicked out? It's probably a glitch. It's probably a glitch. Hello? You there, bro? Hello? Sorry, I'm losing you, I think. Kicked me out. Hello? Hello? Like, Hello? I don't see any quotes of saints. I'm glad this is recorded, right, I think. It, it, all right, it kicked me off. It kicked I mean, me this off. is a cheek clapping of enormous proportions, I think. Like, yeah, so, it's know, pretty obvious. I think as so. you can go on. Yeah, yeah. No, what I was saying is that even in Israel itself, the Hasidic Jewish population resists conscription into the IDF. So to say that there's something, there's an equivalence between the Zionist state and the Jewish people is wrong. The Hasidic population, and you you have to understand, Hasidics are the bedrock and the foundation of Judaism. You understand that Zionism was a secular project. All of this, it was inspired by German nationalism applied to Jews. It doesn't have anything to do with the roots of what you call Jewish civilization, which is what you find in the Hasidic community. And if you look to that community, they are overwhelmingly aligned on 
pretty much every issue at every level they stand with the traditional forces against the globalist agenda of the liberal elites so i lived in I, Heights for a year bro please don't lecture me on the zionism of orthodox jews what have you ever been to crown heights new york uh I, what's the what's the point you ever heard of chabad lubavitch dude have you you can name anyone you want the fact of the that's matter, not a person you fucking idiot Okay, you can name whatever whatever thing you want to name. The fact of the matter is that it is a fact. Yeah, I'm not familiar with the thing you just said. I'm not. Has, has, you, you, should, you should never speak to Fuentes about this because it will not end well, buddy. You need dude, to I don't care. <laughs> I speak, dude, okay. I speak. I speak for myself. I don't really give a fuck who disagrees with me. This is my view. Sure. This is your the reason you didn't talk about this till two hours into this thing is because this is this this is incoherent, dude. No, it's not. You I was no... focused. I was focused on other things. So you're saying that all Orthodox Jews, or even the overwhelming majority of Orthodox Jews, like it's unanimous, are pro. Here's our perspective. My I've explained to you my I've I made it pretty clear with this so entire you're saying space. They're all, you're saying they're you saying about the whole. Let me finish. You're let me saying finish, that the finish. Orthodox Jews no, no, who in you've fact made it burn clear. Israeli flags. I've made it pretty clear. My epistemology throughout this space being that of the church and the saints and the and the, no, all that is rooted. No, it's not. Yes, it is. <laughs> you show can't just tell me my epistemology. Patriarch Kirill, show me where Patriarch Kirill says the Jews are a civilizational enemy of the Russian. I can Orthodox show church. you because Patriarch Kirill reads the Gospel of John and whenever it comes up in the church calendar, and the jo Council of John says, and the Jews said, "Let our blood be on our heads and on our children and on our children's children." That's Again, in the Gospel. This of is John. theology. That's what, no, this no, is theology. no, yeah, yeah, exactly. Because you have this silly bifurcation between you say, talk about being sublime, yet you bifurcate the theological reality of the world and the simple material because you have. This silly, Does Patriarch Kirill himself do dialectic, that? Dude. Patriarch, Kirill, Patriarch Kirill himself does that when You're he meets Cartesian with the representatives. Dog. When he meets with the representatives of the Orthodox Jewish community, despite theological differences, and lends out his hand and, and his uh, dialogue to say, "We are still united against the Satan at Satanic West in defense of the traditional religions of Russia." That's his opinion. I'm not sure that's what it says. he says at the meetings, has just as we don't necessarily, we're meeting here, but we don't agree eye to eye with you. So despite, you're saying Patriarch you know, Kirill meets with these, the representatives of the Jewish Orthodox community and rebukes them and condemns them? You think that's likely? No, no unfortunately, he meets with them in the context of advising Putin, who is slightly too compromised to Zionist interests. As no, about he meets Kirill them in the context of defending Russia's traditional religions against the Satanism of so-called Western secularism. No, and what does what impact does this have on say the orthodox civilization worldview? Like, because what does it, this mean? Because how can right. you say that the opinion that Jews are the enemies of uh, Christian civilization is reflected in someone who's making allies of Jewish ask leaders? the Jews? <laughs> what do you mean? Ask Look up Norm Jews? Eisen. What Wait, did Norm Eisen Jews? have to say? Which Jews? What did do? Norm? The ones in power. Every Jew in power. How about that? Okay. I, uh, 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 look. Look. The ones that run the media, the ones that run. The okay, well, well, bring them into the space and have them talk and make their case. Oh, all that um, until they do. I don't. The I'm ones not in the sure. Ukraine. That How am I supposed Ukraine? to fucking respond to that? How do I fucking respond to such a vague illusion? Bring this person into the space and have them speak, and let's parse whether or not they can be said to speak for all of the Hasidic Jewish community. Dude, this is sophistry, and you know it. Everyone knows who no, I'm. No, I think you are. I think it's very clear that you are pathologically above and beyond. What can be afforded by reason pathologically fixated on this stupid nah, you're, uh stupid now you're gonna now you're gonna try Jews. to slander us and throw us in and, and use yeah, the powers that these it's not slander it's you has, have has. a pathological enmity toward jews i don't share okay has, that's fine you, you don't share a lot of things with us right including christianity to be honest so yeah I'm we a don't Muslim. actually that's expect the thing. you to be i've never lied about that i'm actually a muslim right. so I'm in the same boat as these Jews, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I mean, you're not. Okay, yeah, Jews and Muslims are at civilizational war with Christians. That's a historical fact. <laughs> but but Kadyrov, who's fighting alongside Putin against Zelensky's Satanism, go tell him that. Go tell Kadyrov he's at war with Christians right now, and see what Kadyrov will do to you. Dude, you're a fucking larper. You're not even a real Orthodox Russian Christian. Uh, you're a you're fucking, don't fuck, who are you Russian, fucking talking to? Who's a real the fucking actual, Christian? Dude, you're not a real fucking Muslim. You're telling the actual Russian Orthodox people. You fucking retard. You fucking retard. You fucking retard. You fucking 
Muslims are at war with you. Dude, you're so fucking dude, LARP, but you're not even a real Orthodox Russian Christian. Right yeah. Yeah. Now. You're also you're telling the actual Russian leaders of Russia. Dude, you're telling the actual What a fundamentally stupid thing to say. Muslims are fucking retard. Get the fuck out of here. you are just a fucking LARPer living in the West making these- how many people have the enemy right now Muslims and Jews are at war with Christian civilization. Dude, you're literally playing fucking- You're playing Crusader Kings or some shit on your computer in a fucking Australia. Who the like, fuck are you to say your that? You're, you're, you're defaming and insulting so the Chechen Muslim soldiers who have given their life for their country, Russia, against Zelensky and against Ukraine. Oh, they're at war with Christian civilization. You are insulting the alliance in Syria between the Muslims and Christians that were fighting ISIS. You're insulting Iran in the way it was... You can see the debate. No, you fucking idiot. You're faggot moron. What a pussy. Dude, they removed me. They removed me. They removed me. Debate over. Manhood conceded. I accept your surrender, bitch. Fucking remove me from the space, you little bitch. I'm sorry, there's only so much I can take. It's like I'm trying to explain to this person there needs to be a unity between traditional believers and shit, right? And he goes, yeah, well, you're a Muslim, Haas, and Muslims and Jews are at war with Orthodox civilization. I am a true Russian Orthodox Christian. Never mind the fucking fact that Kadyrov and the Chechens are on the ground fighting alongside the Russian armed forces, they're literally at the vanguard of it, and he's saying he's trying to cause division between these fucking people. It's unreal. Look at Syria. Look at how the Muslim and Christian coalitions came together to fight ISIS to defend Assad. Iran doing the same shit. It's like, where the fuck do you get this fucking idea? It's so fucking stupid. But the problem is that you have these fucking LARPers living in the fucking West, talking all this big fucking game, while people are actually giving their life on the ground in a Muslim-Christian alliance fighting against this fucking Satanism. People actually laying down their fucking lives, and he defames that and disrespects all that shit, sitting in the fucking West because he found some new fucking trinket, fucking new gimmick novelty identity. Oh, I, I mean, I've tried to respect their fake Orthodox LARP, but it's fucking LARP, dude. Don't fucking tell me that these converts are on the same fucking level as the actual people born into Orthodox Christian civilization in Russia, in Syria, you know, even in Lebanon, where Orthodox Christians are allied with a certain type of Muslim group, right? Don't fucking sit here and tell me that the re that this reality, that's the that's what people literally breathe, live and breathe. He's going to say, oh, Muslims, Muslims and Jews are at war with Christian civilization. And then that's not even to mention the Orthodox Jews and Hasidic Jews in Russia who also are defending the Russian state against this fucking Satanism. It's like, it's like fed shit, dude. No, I'm not going to throw Jews under the fucking bus. No, I'm not going to condemn my Jewish brothers in humanity who are fighting against the same enemy that I am. It's fucking stupid, dude. At least show me you have a fucking chin before you're going to fucking crucify me for not getting on board with your dumb Jew hatred bullshit. At least have a fucking chin, dude. I don't give a fuck how unpopular it'll make me. I don't care, dude. Let's admit the fact. It's easy to go after Jews because there's not that much of them. Because there's not that much of them. So I'm going to be here to be more popular. I'm going to start attacking Jews and have enmity toward Jews. No, I'm not. I don't care if there's only two Jews in the world. I will not betray my brothers in humanity. I, you, 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 dude, it's like, it's like, what the fuck, dude? You know what I mean? No, mine is the popular position? No, it's fucking not, dude. Because the people that you claim, you think that Jews are running the entire system. I disagree with you. But it's not like the system cuts me any slack for saying this. It's not like I get any slack cut to me when I say I will defend my Hasidic brothers and sisters. You want to know why? Because they call me an anti-Semite anyway. The fucking... The fucking liberals in power call me an anti-Semite anyway. They call me a Nazi. They call me a... I don't get any slack cut to me, dude. I get doxxed. I get fucking threatened. I get defamed. Dude, they throw more shit on me relative to my actual fucking influence than anyone I know. For anyone at my level of influence, I'm only at 20,000 followers or something, I get more shit thrown on me than anyone else. They don't fucking... They don't fucking cut me any slack for doing this shit. So no, it's not a fucking popular position. They cancel the fuck out. They try to kill me, dude.
They threaten to do that all the time. They don't cut me any fucking slack. Just the other day, these leftists, dude, you have no idea. They're literally trying to find me physically to do harm. You know what I mean? You think I get slack on me? I get fucking deplatformed and banned from every fucking platform? Oh, huh, but you got unbanned from Twitter. Everyone got unbanned from Twitter. They fucking took me on, down on YouTube. They took my Twitch away. And by they, I mean the fucking liberals. I, you think it's Jews, and you're saying, oh, Haas, you're just, you're not willing to sell out your Hasidic brothers because you're just taking the popular position. But the actual people in power don't cut me any slack. And by the way, they don't even like those Hasidic Jewish people. Learn about it, dude. Those Hasidic Jewish people don't have a presence. They're not visible. They're extremely marginalized. They live in extreme poverty in devotion to their fucking beliefs. Now, do you have to agree with them theologically? You don't. I don't. I'm a Muslim, right? But I can still respect them as my brothers in humanity. My In my religion, Imam Ali said, you have brothers in faith and you have brothers in humanity. Maybe that's just a Muslim thing, but I'm pretty sure Christians believe something similar. I'm sorry. That's what I fundamentally believe. You know what I mean? Baby. Thank you so much, GEC. Us, I appreciate you being polite plus listening to the Orthodox. They're all right. Hope they understand you're coming from a good place. Appreciate Seem you, to be man. getting Thank targeted you. by the globalists, including Newland plus like, I don't get any slack. Thank you so much, Chris. Conflating Judaism with Zionism is the game of liberals and the establishment. Yeah. Exactly. I'm not on Based. board with that shit. Thank you so much, Arwa. Based Abrahamic alliance against Satanism. Yeah. Based. Thank you so much, Dementor. Stalin is good. It's like, damn, man. Sometimes I feel like I get targeted, at least on Twitter, more than the ultra-right does. How often do you see fucking tweets go viral about me? 5,000 likes based on lies. How often do you fucking see that? Every day. Right? You saw it yesterday. They don't cut me any fucking slack. I'm still canceled. I'm still called a Nazi. I'm still called a fascist. I'm still called an anti-Semite. They're always saying, oh, Haas, you, you're talking about the Jews. When you talk about globalist Haas, you're talking about the Jews. They still accuse me of that. I stand with my Hasidic brothers out of principle. I will not sell out even one brother in humanity. I don't care how strong Based. the numbers are. Thank you so much, Super Just Floyd. like these LARPers use plastic flexible swords, likewise their plastic words and language cannot defend anything yeah, with can. real substance. It fucking can't, you know? Based. Thank you so much, Amila. Appreciate Christianity you. is fading and these LARPers want to play Crusader Kings. Shame on Dude, them. Dude, they're fucking LARPers. They're literal fucking LARPers. Holy shit, they're LARPing so fucking hard. They're, it's so detached from the reality on the ground. You know what I mean? It's like there's a right-wing cancel culture and there's a left-wing cancel culture. And if you don't hate Jews, they're going to cancel you. What the fuck is that shit? Because I'm defending these oh people who God. live in... Thank you so much, Dementor. Because I'm defending these people who live like in subsistence levels of poverty, fully devoted themselves to their religion. Because I fucking defend those people, that that makes me a sellout. Get the fuck out of here, man. It's not, it's not manly. You can't look those people in the eye and see me with them and go, you are my enemy. What? People who have so much conviction and belief, and I'm supposed to disrespect that? Dude, they're more holy than I am. I'm an unholy guy. I do a lot of sin. I engage in a lot of fucking sin. And I have in the past, too. These Orthodox Jews are more Based. Muslim than I am. You're a great man. Thank you, Tristan. Solid as they come. These, a lot of these Orthodox Jews are more Muslim than I am. Based. Who the fuck am I to say on their mind? was right. Thank you, the king. These Appreciate people blame you. Jews for their personal failures. Exactly. That's ex And that's what Putin said, right? Everyone's a sinner. And that's what I actually wanted to give a lecture about after this debate was done. Because I was thinking a lot about the Christian idea of forgiveness, right? And what I mean by forgiveness is it's like, 
I'm not cut any slack. And that's why I forgive everyone despite their ideology. I forgive everyone despite their ideology, right? Based. Thank you so much, Alexander. Appreciate Very you. Very excited for the future of infrared. Let's go. Thank you so much, Alexander. Appreciate you. I believe in forgiving all these canceled people, even all these right-wing people who have these views. I forgive all of them. I forgive them because I was canceled in the same way. This is my earnest and honest message to all these good leftists that are out there. There's only a few that are left. I hope I don't I hope they didn't say some horrible defamatory shit about me I don't know about because I don't really keep up with them. But from what I know, the Midwestern Marx gang and that guy Noah forgot his last name, those are decent guys. From what I know. They're decent, they're decent people, right? They're decent, honest. I disagree with them about Base. some stuff. Thank you so much, Liar Liar They think Islam is attacking Christianity when Islamic empires were more tolerant to Christians inside their empire than Christians yeah. were to each Thank other. Thank you so much, Lyceros. You know what I mean? And uh, that's that, right? But my 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 good faith, just thing I want to, friendly, friendly thing I want to say is like, I think the disagreement comes from the fact that I, I don't just think the problem is a certain type of leftist. I don't think it's just the synthetic left. I think when you have a left that condemns and crucifies human beings on the fucking cross, canceling them and dehumanizing them in such an illegitimate way, you have to do the Christological thing and forgive everyone. You have to say, I'm done with leftism. I'm done Base. with this way of approaching reality. It's Thank really you, telling Fox. to me that when they tried to use the Gospel of John against you, they couldn't quote the passages correctly. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me. I'm not even like an expert when it Base. comes to theology. Thank you so Yerovsky, much, Jack. who participated in the ritual executions, later boasted about his sacral historic mission. I always wondered if there was a Shabbatian Frankist connection. What do you think? Great stream. I, I'm not familiar. All I know is that Lenin didn't give the order. That's all I know about the execution of the Romanovs. That's that's the only thing I'm aware of, right? I didn't I haven't looked into what the motivations were or anything. But what I'm trying to say here is that a lot of a lot of people like Nohaz don't write off the entirety of the left. Why are you writing off all of the left because of these these ones that are attacking you. Because if they call me a Nazi, if they call me a fascist, even the actual people in America who call themselves fascists must be forgiven. Because how do you even know that they're legitimately fascist? How do you know they are? How do you know they haven't just succumbed to the fucking evil reflected by what we call the left, right? Remember that speech I gave about two years ago? I hate the cloth a snake wears to disguise itself. Meaning, for me, when you're saying, Haas, they're not real leftists, they're just CIA people disguising themselves as leftists. But I take the Christological stance and say, even if it's a synthetic CIA plot, I don't care. The fact that they can disguise themselves in this form condemns the form. If they can disguise themselves in a form, even that form is condemned. And to me, that's the meaning of Christian forgiveness. Christian forgiveness is not, oh, I'm going to ignore crimes. No, Christian forgiveness is about an indictment on the greatest of all crimes. And that is an illegitimate and unjust institution. The very institution from whence crime and justice is judged, right, is made. That is the true evil which must be destroyed. And that is what frees us from our debts. That Base. is true forgiveness. Keep Thank destroying you so much, Jimmy. these snakes. See, true Christian forgiveness, true Christian forgiving of debts, doesn't mean you sit here and go, I'm going to ignore that this person was financially irresponsible. It means the very institution of the bank, the very institution by which people are making money, is illegitimate and must be destroyed. Forgiveness is a revolutionary act. Forgiveness is the destruction of empire. Forgiveness is what destroys the very source of the evil. So my reason why I reject leftism is because their way of canceling people and filtering out and isolating, oh, this person is the enemy, so anything is, anything is allowed against them. Anything is allowed against them. Kill, torture, rape, doesn't matter. Anything is allowed against them. That whole foundation is corrupt. The whole thing. The fact that evil people are able to hijack it is a form of corruption. I believe in forgiveness. 
I think something maybe similar happened even with the Orthodox Church. With all of the Freemasons and so on who infiltrated the Orthodox Church, maybe the Church needed, it was the divine plan, for it to be set on a new foundation. That is Christological forgiveness. Forgive the Bolsheviks for the League of Militant Atheists. Forgive the Bolsheviks for their uh, blasphemous, the rank and file cagers on the ground. Forgive all of that. Because it was the ins it was the corrupt institution of those claiming to be religious, but who served Satan in reality, that led to that in the first place. And because it, when let me tell you something. When the devil is in Rome, when the devil is in Rome, one cannot distinguish saint from sinner. One has to forgive everyone equally, even those who are truly guilty. I find this to be a beautiful and extremely powerful, powerful Christological notion. It's inherent in the Christological concept of forgiveness which is so fucking revolutionary and powerful. It's like, Haas, you're a MAGA communist? That means you're going to be working with all these racists and bigots? Yes! Even the ones that are actually racist and bigoted. Yes, I forgive them. All of them. All of them. I'm not a fucking leftist anymore. I forgive all these people. All of the debt is cleared. Now let's start from a new beginning. Now let's talk to these people. Now let's actually build... Hope. You want to talk about the evil of racism? Let's create a positive alliance of races. Let's unite the white people and the black people. I forgive the, everyone for being racist. I don't care if you're actually a deplorable. I don't care. I want to go forward. I forgive you. I forgive you. I am not a leftist. To me, that is Christological forgiveness. It means even when According to the state, they say, Haas, we need to hide behind Joe Biden to prevent fascism. No! Allow the fascism. Allow it. I forgive it. The anti-fascist democratic state is what must be condemned. I forgive the so-called enemy because the foundation, the church here is corrupt. The cathedral of liberal democracy is corrupt. So I forgive its enemies. They called me a fascist. They called me a Nazi. That means their entire foundation of accusing anyone of anything is wrong and corrupt. That means even the people that are actually guilty are now forgiven. Because they're, it's, like, it's like if you have a corrupt criminal justice system, the whole prison has to be emptied. The whole prison must be empty. It was in the song, White, White Army, Black Baron. Red Army is the strongest. Empty the prisons. We will empty the prisons. What about the real criminals? Even the real criminals. Because the whole foundation of the law was corrupt. And then in the future, will the criminals be caught? Will justice occur? Yes. But justice does not take steps. Justice works like a sword cleaving its target in two. All at once. And then afterwards, a new foundation must be built. The most revolutionary thing is forgiveness. You forgive them. And then in the future, if they stay evil and they stay wicked like the anime nazis we will confront them as the enemy yes we will they say oh you're a sucker Haas. you're forgiving all these people they're gonna stab you in the back i don't care i'm ready for it i'm ready for it i will not hide behind the corrupt american left and its corrupt institutions i am in that same wilderness even if i have to claw my way out fighting Truly evil, wicked people who even deserved to be condemned. Even if they deserve the judgment of the law. When the law is corrupt, they are forgiven. And you must learn why they're evil again. If they truly are evil. But you must give them the good faith. You have to give them a chance. 
And that's what the left hasn't fucking done for these MAGA people. Give them a fucking chance! Give them a chance! I'm wagering on them! I don't believe MAGA is fundamentally bigoted and racist and all these things. I don't believe it. I forgive them and I start from a new foundation. That's MAGA communism. It is based in the Christological notion of forgiveness. So this stuff they were saying about oh the, the Jews and so on and so forth that oh Base. thank you so much soapbox you're one hundred percent right us leftists don't want to forgive they want to be excused only the things that can't be excused can be forgiven that's the basis of Christology a dialectic of justice and mercy exactly thank you so much soapbox he said something about oh well the Jews in the crowd said we take it upon ourselves. The crime upon ourselves and our sons. Do you not see how radically at odds with the Christian logic that claim was? This was, yes, a polemic against Judaism, but not for, not in the form of indicting the Jewish people and their, their progeny and their ancestors. The whole point is that Christ died for your sins. So even if, according to Christian theology, some Jews committed the sinful act, even they are forgiven. There is no eternal burden of, of debt on the Jewish people for what happened to Jesus. That is radically anti-Christian kind of theology. Christianity is about forgiveness. Am I wrong about that? How can you do this satanic thing and have this pathological enmity on Jews? who, after all, are part of God's creation. Base. Thank you so much, Knight of Babylon. As an Orthodox Christian, I think these people have demonstrated the need for neophytes to reach a certain level of maturity in the faith before one should cultivate an online presence. God bless. I agree. Thank you so much, Knight of Babel. I agree. Now, I'm not denying there's a theological dispute between Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Just saying, that dispute should not be brought to the status of human enmity should not have enmity to another human being because they're not your brother in faith. There are Christian polemics against Judaism. After all, Christianity was founded as a break-off from Judaism. Fine. That does not have to translate into actual enmity against your fellow man because he's of a different religion. Base. Thank you so much, Finn W. Those two could be interchanged with the Pharisees in the story of Christ. All words and no acts. Yeah. It's like, the oh, is it's so convenient that your position happens to be the one that's, uh, allowed i don't dude i don't get any slack cut to me that's the fucking thing Based. thank you so much tanks when christ was crucified he said father forgive them for they do not know what they do yeah i mean i'm not an expert in christianity but isn't that what he said isn't that what he said I just think we're living in an era where Muslims, Jews, and Christians are starting to come together and unite. And I reject, I reject enmity toward the Jews as a whole people. There are individual Jews who are bad. There are individual Christians who are bad. There are individual Muslims who are bad. Look up the Moscow Military Cathedral uh, with um, with 
with uh I've seen that. I've seen the Moscow Cathedral. I've seen it. There will not be any alliance between the Abrahamic faiths if you cut off one of the links. You can't exclude anyone. I don't get any slack, man. It's like, I already... I'm at war with the whole left. You know, these people are fucking vicious too, right? I will not change in my principles. I will not change. I don't get anything. I don't get checks cut to me by fucking institutions. I'm not in league with the fucking anything in power. Nothing. That's convert zealotry, honestly. You know, this is one of the reasons I'm actually just a communist so strongly. There needs to be some way to just be about humanity, right? I, I can't do this thing where, oh yeah, let's start going and, and attacking each other over religious differences. I can't do, you know what I mean? We got to be Mongols. There's got to be a way for there to be some universal humanity that doesn't produce enmity between people based on religion. You know what I mean? For me, that's communism. I am a communist. Everybody needs to be humbled. I'm a Genghis Khan communist. Genghis Khan came and he whooped everyone's ass. He whooped, he said, all you people fighting each other over religion, I'm going to whoop all of your ass. And you're going to have to coexist. That's what I believe. I mean, I am a Muslim in my heart, right? But I will never, ever put an identi a religious identity between me and my fellow man. I will never put let a label come in between me and my fellow man. If there's any truth to religion, it's true here and now. It's not true eventually in the future. It's true here and now. As we're sitting here fighting the wickedness, evil, and lies, the empire Base. of lies ruling over us. Let's Thank be you, honest. Conservatives and traditionalists accept dogmas uncritically. It doesn't mean they can't be right. They often are, but they have not thought anything through. I feel like it's not even true Base. traditionalism. Thank you, Tanks. When Christ told God to forgive those who tortured and killed him, 
It really spoke to me. It still does, and I'm not even religious anymore. Thank you so much, Tanks. Yeah, it's powerful. Shit is powerful. Uh, it's like, damn. Satan is called Satan the Accuser, right? Unless I'm wrong. Pretty sure it was called the Accuser. I'm not here to be the Accuser. Jews, Christians, Muslims, Atheists, Hindus, Buddhists, all can be my brothers in humanity. As long as you're fighting side by side with me for communism. Let God judge us for our deeds here on earth and the hereafter. But let us never put a dead letter in between us and the living task called before us to fight against the injustice, evil, and wickedness here on earth. This is my statement. I've seen evil. I've seen evil firsthand. I see even in the way they defame me. It's evil. It's wickedness. They say things about me. You don't know where it came from. It came from planet Jupiter. What but evil is behind this? It's evil. It's wickedness. Those who spread deceit. Those who slander. Those whose foundation, the foundation of their whole world is lies. Is based in lies. The war we are in is black and white, truth and falsehood. It's truth and falsehood. You can surrender the truth. You can give in to the weight of falsehood, to slander. It's easy to do that. It's hard to fight for truth. It's hard to fight for truth. The basic idea of Christological forgiveness, it's simple. I'm going to simplify it for you. You can have enmity between two human beings. I'm a leftist. Oh, this person's a bigot. This person's a racist. I have a dispute with this person. This is between you and another person. But when you become condemned by the law, right, by society, by the gaze of the big other, by law, right, and this is transcending the enmity between two human beings and is now an enmity between the law and a human being. And when that enmity has as its foundation corruption, falsehood, deceit, illegitimacy, it's no longer between you and another person. The whole fucking system is rotten. 
and even those who are actually guilty of crimes must be forgiven. Forgiveness destroys an empire. It destroys the very foundation. You now have to roll the dice and say, I'm going to free the prisons. Are some murderers and rapists going to escape along with the falsely accused? Yes. And if they commit their crimes again, we'll throw them in prison again. But we'll throw them in a new prison. In a prison whose foundation is based in righteousness and justice. That's the meaning of forgiveness. Year zero. We will never ever take refuge in any corrupt form of justice. We won't take refuge. We won't take refuge in a false system of justice. So let even the guilty, let even the truly guilty be forgiven. We will not hide behind the powers that be. Oh, but Haj, this person's a Nazi, this person's a fascist. But you are my enemy. We'll see if this person is a Nazi or a fascist. In practice, we will see if they're actually engaging in genocidal extermination against their fellow man. We'll see. But you're the Nazi in my here and now. It's you. It's not them. They are now forgiven. To falsely accuse someone is to forgive even the guilty. One who is falsely accused exonerates even the guilty. That's what I say. One who is falsely accused exonerates even the guilty. The guilty are forgiven for every one person who's falsely accused. The guilty one is forgiven. No point to forgive the devil. He only does it again. Let him do it again. That's the risk associated with Christian forgiveness. You're taking on a risk now. You're saying, I'm clearing the debt. I'm clearing the sins. Now, yes, they'll sin again. They do sin again. Since Christ, of course, man has sinned. But he still forgave them up until then. And there's a reason for that. Because the debt, all of it, was illegitimate. I'm saying this as a Muslim, by the way. Based. Thank you so much, Red South. I used to be a leftist. I realized they wanted me to condemn my own people. Then I knew they are not what they think they are. Yeah. All right. Uh, unless we have any more debates.
What about pedals? No, you don't forgive them. <laughs> I'm not saying there are no unforgivable things. I'm talking about the manner by which systems, not people, become condemned. That happens with forgive a general forgiveness. But yes, there are some individual crimes that are fundamentally unforgivable. Absolutely. Absolutely, yes. But how those crimes are dealt with cannot be discussed. Do we forgive leftists? We fight. We fight against those trying to eradicate and exterminate us. We resist them. The reason I think those who harm children cannot be forgiven is because you're not doing something against the... It's not a crime in the past. It's a crime on the future. To hurt children is a crime even in the future of debts being cleared. Even after debts have been cleared, you're still engaging in this metaphysical crime against the future. Right? Based. Thank you so much, Chris. Appreciate you. Communists or religious, the purpose is reconciliation. Only those that foreclose this are beyond help. God only helps those that help themselves. But. The thing is, I said when the prisons open. Everyone is free, even the guilty. Well, some people, the moment they walk out, yeah, okay, you're forgiven from the prison. But then you walk out of the prison, and one must account for the living, living, here and now, um, damage they've done to a child. So how will they account for that? According to a new law that uh, brings back forms of punishment that only exist. Never mind. Okay. Follow me on Rumble. I don't, I don't also mean this, I don't mean this literally either. I don't literally mean we should empty all the prisons. No, if there's a proletarian dictatorship, you're going to keep a lot of people in prison. Murderers, just saying kind of metaphysical, uh, in principle is what I mean. For example, in politics... It was the left versus MAGA for a long time. Now you must forgive all of MAGA because the left proved its own corruption and wickedness. For example, when the DNC cheated Bernie, that's when it should have been. They should have said, okay, the whole fucking thing is rotten. We must forgive all of MAGA now. You know what I mean? It's like, in it's the logic. It's Christological. It doesn't literally mean... 
literally mean in every circumstance. You forget the wrongdoing in someone's past. It means you can somehow have this logos that relates an institution with people. Okay, guys. Good debate. See you guys tomorrow. Bye-bye. Good debate. See you tomorrow. Hopefully early stream.